Let's go ahead and get started. Today is Monday, November 1st. Uh, welcome to a new month. Uh, but same as it ever was, we a lecture will be muscle physiology. Our lab will be origins, insertions, and actions. A uh, handful of assignments due. Uh, this coming weekend is your last weekend to study uh, because our exam is going to be on uh, Wednesday, uh, the 10th. And uh, again, with a Wednesday exam, we are getting some new information on that Monday. Remember, you have that graded for assignment, uh, Muscle Activity Lab. And then the biggest trick is remember, it's been a while since you've had to do a Physio X. What is that on there? There we go. Um, sorry, this is going to bug me if I don't get it cleaned. Uh, you're, uh, remember the Physio X, you have seven different uh, lab activities, seven different lab reports, all of which need to be turned in and are due. All right, questions on any of that? All right, we left off last class and we had completed the process of a uh, muscle contraction. And at the end of last lecture, we actually went through all of the steps of relaxation and I got some good comments on that. And so I thought a good place to start today would be to have you walk me through the steps uh, with some help of how a muscle contracts from start to finish. Again, this wouldn't be an essay question. As we'll see, it's far too long to be an essay question, but I think it's a good exercise to remind ourselves of all of the intermediate steps, all of the immediate steps, everything we need to be successful on that. So let's do that. Contracting a muscle. What is the very first thing that has to happen? Making the decision for that's an neural action potential. Excellent. We make the decision and we make that decision. Oh, hold on. Let me get my chat window up. Excellent. Absolutely. A couple of you right off the bat. Absolutely. We make that decision. When we make that decision, we produce a neural action potential. And when we produce that neural action potential, what happens? Oh, I've already started spelling things wrong. Excellent. It's a big positive signal. It spreads down the axon and depolarizes the cell. Excellent. Which leads to what? Our axons depolarize, but what's our goal? What do we want to depolarize? This opens the voltage-gated, um, yeah. There you go, calcium channels, which are located where? In the synaptic um, end bulb. So, so not the neural action potential needs to spread down to the synaptic end bulb to depolarize it. Excellent. So we spelled out neural action potential once, I can abbreviate it here, spreads down to the synaptic end bulb and depolarizes it. And you guys are absolutely correct. Our voltage gated calcium channels open. And when those voltage gated calcium channels open, which way does calcium move? Inside the cell. Excellent. Excellent. What does that calcium do? It triggers the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Excellent, I like that. Excellent. What happens once that acetylcholine is in the synaptic cleft? It diffuses across the synaptic cleft and it binds to the Completely gated cation channels. Excellent. And when those uh, chemically gated cation channels open, what flows through them? Sodium leaves. Excellent. Oh, no, sorry, enters. I'm sorry.
and potassium leaves the motor end plate. However, do we have equal movement of both? No. 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 Which one has more? Sodium. sodium. Excellent. Lots of sodium enters in the cell and only a little bit of potassium leaves. This is important because if one positive thing left and one positive thing entered, there'd be no change of the motor end plate. But now that we have an uneven flow, what is the net effect on the motor end plate? Depolarization. Is a depolarization. Excellent. Absolutely. So depolarizes and Sarah's correct. If, remember, here's the key to this part. If the depolarization is big enough, remember, it doesn't always have to happen, but if the depolarization is big enough, then we reach threshold. What happens when we reach threshold? It triggers the production of the muscle action potential, yeah. which is the big positive signal. At the motor end plate. Yeah. Which I, will start I am being on. overly <laughs> specific, right? If you don't have every single you know, bit of this detail, then again, you wouldn't necessarily get dinged on it, but it is important. I think when we're going through it to make sure that we have you know, hyper detail here just to make sure that we all understand uh, all of the steps that's going on. Absolutely. And of course that muscle action potential doesn't stay there. Absolutely, Sarah, the muscle action potential spreads down the sarcolemma. And not only does it spread down the sarcolemma, but also spreads down T or transverse tubules. Yeah. Excellent. Why is that significant that the muscle action potential spreads down the transverse tubules? To depolarize the triad. And what are the other components that make that triad? Uh, there you go, the two terminal sternae, the triad, excellent. And what happens when the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are depolarized? The voltage curve. Can I also open? Right. And notice since we already spelled it out once, I can just put VG calcium channel open. And calcium is released into the cytosol. Excellent. What does that calcium do when it reaches the cytosol? Excellent. Binds to the troponin. When calcium binds to the troponin, what happens? Troponin undergoes a conformational change, so it changes shape. Changes shape, but again, it is always fun to say that. Undergoes a conformational change. But again, yeah, we can just say, whoops, where did that write? Did that go somewhere else or did that just not type? It went on, on top where it says uh, MAP. Six lines up. Right there. Uh, right above the tooth's animal. What's their name? Yeah. MAP undergoes a right confirmational change. Hold on. Oh, there you go. Got it. <laughs> I have one of those touch pads. I mean, I think I hit it every once in a while with my thumb and that threw screws things up. All right. So it undergoes a conformational change. And when troponin undergoes that conformational change, what happens? Troponin rotates the tropomyosin. And then the, the myosin binding sites are 
um, on acting and in that space. Excellent. And when that myosin binding site is exposed? Myosin grabs the actin and it starts okay. to contract. Can any myosin head grab onto the actin? Primed. Yeah, there myosin you go. Head. Primed. Or again, you can use the term uh, energized, cocked, whatever term you want to use, but that ready to do work myosin head. binds to the actin. What happens when it binds to the actin? Yeah. Oh, thank you, yes. Forming a cross bridge. Excellent. And when it forms that cross bridge, what does it do then? Excellent, performs. Power stroke, and we should probably explain what that means And here. I'm running out of room at the bottom here, so let's sneak up here and do it here. What is that power stroke? There we go, I like that. Pivots towards the M line. Excellent. And as we know, as it does that, it pulls on the actin. And as it pulls on the act and that pulls on the Z disc. So our Z discs get moved closer together. And that shortens the sarcomere. Which shortens the myofibril. And again, you don't have to go into this much depth, but I think it's important to know this. And when it shortens the fibril, it shortens the muscle cell. That change in shape generates our force. It generates our tension, produces our force. Excellent. And one other thing happens while that during that power stroke as well. What else? Thank you. Mycinid releases the ADP and phosphate. Why is that significant? Because it's now a new binding site. Yeah, exactly. For the ATP. Now, exactly. And uh, now a new ATP can bind to the myosin head. That breaks the cross bridge. Excellent. Which is in the myosin, or when the ATP binds to the myosin head, let's go to the actin. Yep. So, which means. Let's go to the actin. Excellent. However, is our myosin head to ready to do work? No. No. What has to happen? Um, let me see. So the ATP splits into ADP plus P plus energy, and that reprimes the myosin head. Excellent. Just a continuous process. This energy. This reprimes, revitalizes, recocks. process continues. Notice, as I mentioned, this is the longest physiological process, but I don't think it's the most complicated. 
yes, we've written a lot on the board here, but every single one of these steps is pretty simple and basic and straightforward. Pretty much every single one of these steps are something we could explain to our grandmothers and our grandmothers would understand, right? So I think that it's not that it's bad in that it is hard. I think it's bad just because it's long. So I think that's really the real trick to this. And you can see now why this wouldn't be an essay question by itself, just because it is such a long process. So what we did is we took this, well, let's first questions on this, what we have on the board before we move the step forward. Any questions on anything that's here? Notice there's no new information. This is all stuff we worked on last week. But like I said, I think it's worthwhile to go through this. All right, so lastly, just like we did in the last class, we divide this process into three easily digestible pieces. What is the first process, the first chunk of this that we rip off? What do we call that? Communication. Yeah. I'm gonna abbreviate it here. Communication at the neuromuscular junction. Excellent, All right? Where does that begin in this process? Make a decision in your brain. Make the decision, excellent. And where does it end? Um, MAP spreads down the circle. Yeah, I like that. Circle on the produce the muscle action potential at motor and plate. Excellent. Yeah, and if you wanted to say that muscle action potential spreads down the circle lemma, that would be fine too. Yeah, either of these would be acceptable for your end point for that. Excellent. What is step two? Excitation. There you go. Sarah jumped again ahead of me. I love that. Excitation contraction coupling. <coughs> Excuse me, where does that begin? Yeah, basically where this one ended. Remember, because it's a continuous process where one ends, the other begins. And where does excitation contraction coupling end? Oh, we've done so well so far. Come on, don't fall apart at me now. Where does excitation contraction coupling end? I'd go a little further. Remember, think, remember we were thinking in terms of goals. Remember the goal of excitation contraction coupling, there you go, is to rotate the, um, to rotate the regulatory proteins out of the way. So I would say, uh, right at kind of in between where you guys are. So when troponin rotates the tropomyosin, and the binding site is exposed. I would say that's probably, because remember that was our goal. Our goal is to move the regulatory proteins and that's where we've moved the regulatory proteins. And then of course, what's step three? There you go, slide and filament theory or contractile cycle. I love it, you guys got both of them. Excellent. And of course, then, therefore, that one starts with the regulatory proteins moving out of the way. And because it is a cycle, it is a continuous process that keeps going around and around and around until we decide for it to stop. And there you go. Just that simply, we have gone through the process of making our muscle contract. Like I said, it's not hard, it's just a long process. So as long as you can remember these steps, put it into these more easily digestible pieces, I know you can be successful on the exam. All righty, questions on this? Now that's a lot of time, 20 minutes to spend on a review, but I think this is important to make sure we understand this because as I've said, now that we have this under our belt, we can now finally start building up until we understand how our body moves through space. So any questions on that before we move on? All right, excellent. 
So we now know how to make a muscle contract. What determines how long that muscle is going to contract for? The amount of calcium. Okay, excellent. Obviously, the amount of calcium. We have to have calcium available. And is calcium moved, uh, uh, is used up by the process? No. No. So really, it's about how much calcium. So it's not about calcium being used up, but how much calcium is in the cytosol. Excellent. That's one of the factors that can influence it. What's another factor that influences how long we can contract? If there's any free ATP. Okay, excellent. All right, we need to have that energy primarily from, oops, from ATP. That is gonna be vitally important. Anything else? I'm asking the question and drinking my coffee. There must be something else. Yeah. Um, how long the contraction is going on for? True, but what determines that? What determines how long I contract them? There you go. Yeah, I like that. Right. The stimulation, absolutely. Obviously, one limiting factor is how many uh, neural action potentials we produce. However, as we saw with the use of the botulinum toxin, it actually really isn't how many action potentials I produce. It's really how much acetylcholine that can be released. So the whole point of that neural action potential is to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So it's really about how much acetylcholine is in the synaptic cleft, and then obviously how many receptors there are for it to bind to. So notice there's a lot of factors. As I think we talked about this a little bit in the last class. Oh, not the last class, but when we talked about the, the first process a while ago. Uh, remember, most acetylcholine gets removed from the anaptic cleft. How? Oh, acetylcholine esterase? Yeah, the enzyme acetylcholine esterase that gobbles up the acetylcholine. We talked about if you, if you took the acetylcholine esterase out of the synapse, out of the synaptic cleft, would the muscle then contract forever? No. No, eventually some, it would be endocytosed or it would diffuse away, but it would be a lot longer contraction. You would decide to relax the muscle and it would be a while before it actually relaxed. It wouldn't relax right away because it would be, it would take longer to get that acetylcholine out of the synaptic cleft. Right. If we move the cells further apart, more diffusion would be, would occur, and so you again that would make it uh, would make it shorter. So there's lots of ways we can modify this communication, this length of the contraction. So again, how much uh, stimulation? Which really, like we said, it's not so much the stimulation, but it's all about the acetylcholine and how long that's available how much calcium is available, and how much ATP is available. All of these are things that uh, can affect it. And again, notice these are our three main chemicals, acetylcholine, calcium, and ATP. And they're the three chemicals that we have to control. Those are the ones we have to move or get rid of. Those are the ones that determine how long that muscle is going to contract for. And again, as we keep emphasizing, when this muscle contracts, it's all occurring at the level of the sarcomere. But remember, the sarcoplasm goes uh, uh, throughout the entire cell, the sarcolemma and those transverse tubules go throughout the entire cell. So when our sarcomere contracts, it's not just one, it's all of them in that myofibril. But what we can see here is the effect that that contraction has on our sarcomere. If you think about our sarcomere, the sarcomere basically had five components to it, right? A band, what is the A band again? The dark band. The dark band, and what determines the dark band? Myosin. Yeah, how, where, wherever there's myosin, that is the A band. 
and the part that doesn't have myosin, what do we call that? I band. I band, excellent. We have the boundaries, the Z lines that are formed by the Z disks. We have the center line formed by the myomesin, the M line. And what's the other region? The H band. H band or H zone, both of those are acceptable. Excellent, oops, of course you gotta spell them right. And what is what does that represent? What is the H band? That's where there's only myosin and no actin. Exactly, that is the part that only contains myosin with no overlapping myosin and actin. So excellent, so let's think about how or if these change when the muscle contracts. Let's start easy. Does the A band change when the muscle contracts? Yes. What determines the A band again? Myosin. It's the part that has myosin. Does the myosin band itself, I know the myosin heads are grabbing and pulling, but does the length of the myosin filament actually change when the muscle contracts? Oh, no, just the actin. Yeah, just the actin moves. So notice the A band doesn't actually change. It stays the same. But the I band is the part that does not have myosin in it. It's the part that just contains the actin. And notice as it contracts, myosin and actin overlap more. So while the A band doesn't change, what happens to the I band? Shortens. Excellent. Notice it gets much, much shorter. Excellent. Obviously, the Z lines don't change a shape or anything like that, but do they change in relation to each other? Yes. Yeah. What happens to them? Um, they get closer together. Yeah. Right. And as they move closer together, our sarcomere gets shorter. And while our Z line moves, what about our M line? It stays the same. Stays the same. So then the last question is what happens to the H band? It disappears. Absolutely. And that's a great way to describe it. It also gets shorter because notice, because myosin and actin are overlapping more. However, even though this particular illustration doesn't show it, it is actually possible for the actin to come all the way to the middle where it would interact with the myomesin. And if the actin came all the way to the middle and interact with the myomesin, what would happen to the H-band? Would there be an H band left? Yeah. No. Yeah, in fact, it could go away entirely. Can, it doesn't have to, but if we, if we contract the muscle enough for the two uh, actins from the two sides of the sarcomere come together, then our H band would go away entirely. So notice of our four regions, uh, pardon me, five regions, two of them don't change, but three of them do. Now, it's easy so to, it, oh, go ahead. Is it important to know that sometimes the H band can stay and sometimes it disappears entirely or? Well, it, it would give you a sense of how much the muscle's contracting. If the H band is just shorter, then you know you're not fully contracting that muscle. Whereas if it's getting to the point where it's overlapping, you pretty much got that muscle contracted as much as it can, right? Okay. And again, as we build up to the level of the bicep brachia, yeah, I can contract it a little bit or I can contract it a little bit more and I can contract it to a little bit more and I can contract it all the way. So as I'm thinking about how the muscle cells are really, again, we're still at the level of the organelle, how the organelles are changing, right? I have less H zone, less, 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 less until I've got it contracted the most, at which point then my H band has pretty much gone away. So it can give us an indication of how much the muscle is contracting. 
it's easy to see these things on a simple illustration like this, but this is actually what is happening in the muscle cell, right? Notice here, again, we have that illustration, but above the illustration here, we actually see, as we've talked about before, how they use an electron microscope. And with this electron microscope, we can actually see the individual proteins inside of a single myofibril. So here we can very clearly see the Z disks and the M line and the A band and the H zone. So all of these things can be seen really clearly, right? Here are our Z disks. Here's our A, I mean, our I band over here, right? Here we have our A band containing the myosin. Notice at the center, we have our H band, just the myosin. And then smack dab in the middle, we have the M line. So we have a nice large H band. Our A band and our I band are very similar in size. And this is what our relaxed muscle looks like. Notice when we contract the muscle, we see those changes. Notice the I band is now tiny, right? The A band is not changed, right? Notice if we cheat, and if I've done a good job of lining up these two pictures, notice the length of the A band hasn't changed, but the length of the I bands has changed dramatically. Notice if we look at the locations of the Z disc, and then we contract it. Z discs have moved inward. Our sarcomere has gotten shorter, but notice that our M line is still in the same place. And notice that where we had a nice big H band before, oops, wrong direction. There's maybe the tiniest of an H band left. Maybe you can see a little bit of lightness there. So that's changed dramatically as well. So those changes that we anticipate, we actually see in a real life muscle in that sarcomere when it is contracted. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Now that we know what's happening in a single sarcomere, we can put them together into our myofibril. Notice if all the sarcomeres in a myofibril all contract at the same time, then notice our entire myofibril gets shorter. And remember, thanks to the myomycin, which holds not just the myofibrils together, but also connects to the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. And there are other structural proteins we didn't talk about. When our myofibril gets shorter because it's connected to the muscle cell, our muscle cell gets shorter. So it's these little myosin and actin heads interacting. That is what changes the shape of the muscle, produces the tension, produces the force that moves our body through space. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as our muscle cell changes shape, it pulls on the connective tissues around us and generates that force or generates that tension. And I've clearly used these two words interchangeably and they are interchangeable terms, force or tension for our purposes. Uh, we can use them interchangeably. And as we said, that is what is gonna move our body through space. Now, the total amount of tension that a muscle like the bicep brachia can produce is going to be determined by how many muscle cells are all pulling and contracting together in unison. All right, so whether or not you can lift that Volkswagen bug is going to be determined by the size of your muscles, 
the number of muscle cells you have, the number of myosin heads that you have in it, and how much total tension you can produce. However, when you contract a muscle, is it always being contracted at the force level of being able to try to lift a car? Is that the amount of force I'm using to lift a pen? No. No, of course not. So clearly we have the ability to change how much tension we are producing. Now, one way, of course, we can do that is by changing how many muscle cells, right? If it only took one muscle cell to lift this pen, and then I have two pens that I wanna lift, well, then how many muscle cells do I have to use then? Two, yeah, exactly. It wasn't a trick question. Absolutely, that I would need to use two muscle cells. So clearly I can change the amount of muscle cells I use, but actually within a single muscle cell itself, they don't always pull at the exact same force. We can change how much tension a single muscle cell produces. A single muscle cell can produce more or it can produce less force. And there are two primary ways we can do that. One is by the length of the muscle cell at the beginning of the contraction. And the second way we can change how much tension a muscle cell produces is by the frequency of the stimulation. How many neural action potentials we send it. Let's see how this works. And we will start easy by talking about the stretch of the muscle cell first. For this, I'm going to cheat and go to my whiteboard and grab a new page and draw a very simple sarcomere. And let's make this even more obvious. All righty. Let's say this is the resting state of my sarcomere. Now, clearly, a myosin, how many myosin heads does this particular myosin filament have? 12. 12. Excellent. All right. Clearly, myosins have more heads than that. And obviously, a myofibril has more than one myosin and more than four actin and all that. But like I said, we're going to go very simple and simplistic and say that this is our starting point. Now, if this was our starting point, we release the calcium, we move the regulatory proteins, how many of our myosin heads would be able to generate force right now? Two, I'm sorry, well, eight. Eight, absolutely. So we could generate eight myosin heads worth of force, whatever that value ended up being. Does that make sense? Everybody see why? Why can only eight of our myosin heads generate force? Because our actin is only over two. Um, right, well, side. eight over eight of them, absolutely, on, to, on each side. There's only two, absolutely. Two, notice important rule here. Obviously, the 
Well, let's go back even more. The force of a contraction is determined by the number of power strokes performed, right? Does that seem like a simple basic rule that makes sense and we understand? But my sin head's got to be able to grab and it's got to be able to perform that power stroke and that's how we generate our tension, right? So in this case with this muscle, we could see that we were able to form eight power strokes worth of energy because obviously to produce tension, the myosin head must be able to grab the actin. Again, very simple, obvious rule. But we know muscles have extensibility and have elasticity. So what would happen if I stretched out this muscle cell a little bit? It would decrease the power stroke. Yeah, notice I only stretched the muscle cell out a little bit, but how much uh, force can this one generate now? Four. Yeah, only four. Notice with just that little stretch, we went from being able to produce eight power strokes worth of force to just four. And in an extreme case, if I stretched the muscle cell out enough, what would happen to the amount of tension you could produce in that muscle cell? No tension. Would that be like fatigue if our muscles were fatigued? This wouldn't be fatigue. This would be what happened last night, right? Last night was Halloween. So like me, you were probably dressed up in, like I like to always get into my sexy nurse costume and go hang out at the bars. And while I'm there at the bars, I may get a lot of unwanted attention from that guy who's had a little bit too much to drink. And if he gets a little too belligerent, the bouncer is going to come over and grab him. And one of the things that a bouncer will do when they grab someone who's being unruly is they take their arms and they pull them behind them to help to stabilize them and lock them in place. And why are they stretching their arms out back behind them like that? It makes them weaker. Yeah. Notice as you're stretching the arm out like that, you make them much weaker. So while they're trying to throw that punch at you, the, a much smaller bouncer is able to stabilize a much bigger guy because by stretching out that muscle, you weaken their muscle, you weaken the amount of force that they can generate. So by stretching out the muscle, right? Or the other thing that the bouncer will do is they'll come and they'll bear hug them. Notice if you bear hug them and do the opposite, You shorten the muscle dramatically. Notice in this case, and I'm gonna have to cheat a little bit and elongate my actin for this to work. Notice if you shorten the muscle a little bit, and of course we can't forget that there is that myomesin along the M line. Oops. Notice here, all the myosin heads are overlapping with actin. So they're all able to grab onto binding sites. But if your actin is starting to bump up against the other actin, if your actin is starting to interfere with the myomesin, are you necessarily going to be able, excuse me, to perform an effective power stroke? No, they're too constricted. Yeah, they're too constricted. So even though, again, remember, it's not just about grabbing onto the actin. Obviously, you have to be able to grab onto the actin, but you also must be able to perform a power stroke. So to produce tension, you must be able to perform a power stroke. Plenty, the actin can grab, I mean, the myosins can grab onto all the actin at this point, 
but they're not able to produce a power stroke. And if they're not able to produce an effective power stroke, are they going to be able to uh, produce and generate a lot of force? No. No. So notice when you're bear hugging that belligerent drunk at the bar, they're again, they're not able to generate a lot of force with their muscles because their muscles are being shortened to the point where they're not effective. So clearly the optimal length is going to be where you have lots of overlap between your myosin and your actin, but also lots of space to perform power strokes. Notice at this length, all of our myosin and actin is overlapping, but there's also plenty of room to perform power strokes. And so notice this would be the optimal length for our muscle to be able to produce its most powerful contraction. I've done this with this really simple illustration. But notice your book does this as well. Notice here, we have this pretty graph that shows exactly what we were talking about. Notice there is an optimal length where there is lots of overlap between the myosin and the actin, but also lots of space for power strokes to be performed. As you stretch the muscle cell out, less and less overlap means less and less power strokes until you stretch the muscle out so far that the myosin and the actin don't overlap at all. And when that happens, what happens to the amount of tension you can generate? You can't. Becomes a big fat zero. Notice as you shorten the muscle cell, you don't lose that much tension until the point where the actin starts to bump into the uh, other actin and it starts to bump into the myomesin. Notice at that point, tension drops dramatically until that muscle, that sarcomere is as short as it can be, as overlapped as possible. And at that point, there's literally no place for it to go. And once again, the tension you are going to produce is zero. Now, like I said, you're not normally getting your arm pulled way back behind you. You're not normally getting your arm squished up against you. So during normal you know, life, our muscles are typically within a normal range where they produce fairly optimal tension. And in fact, when the body is in anatomical position, most most muscles are at their optimal length. So when you're in anatomical position, most of your muscles, notice not all, but most of your muscles are at their optimal length to produce uh, their most powerful contraction. All right. Questions on this? All right, I think this is the easier concept to understand. When we get to the number of action potentials, it gets a little bit more tricky. So even though it is a little bit early, I think that this is a good stopping point so we can come at the second way that we can modify tension, the amount of stimulation that it's getting uh, with fresh brains after the break. So like I said, even though it's a little bit early, let's go ahead and take our first break here. We will restart at 9.05, and at 9.05, I will start the recording. So any questions on this before we take our first break?
All right, then I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Any questions before we get started with the next step? All right. So what we need to talk about now is to take a look at, let's go ahead and draw this. All right, so as we mentioned, the other way we can determine how much strength a single muscle cell produces, how much tension or force a single muscle cell produces is by how quickly we stimulate it. Now, first thing we need to understand about this is what happens when we stimulate a muscle cell once. One, typically with muscle cells, and again, there are things that can modify this. Everything is always more complicated, but typically one neural action potential This is all going to fit, so I'll make it a little bit shorter. One neural muscle action potential produces one muscle action potential. And one muscle action potential produces one twitch. What a twitch is, is a single stimulus, contraction, and relaxation inside of a single muscle cell. And remember, muscle cell, muscle fiber are terms we can use interchangeably. Now, Different muscles in the body will have different twitch rates. So notice, for instance, the muscles that move your eye around in space have a twitch that lasts for about 15 milliseconds. Where's your gastrocnemius? Anyone know where that muscle might be located? It's in your stomach. Not a bad guess with gastro. That is probably a very good guess, right? But uh, no, no one's. Oh, there you go. Mitch has got it. It is our calf muscle, the superficial calf muscle, the gastrocnemius. Notice it twitches at about a rate of one twitch lasting about forty milliseconds. And also, also in your calf region, but deep to the gastrocnemius, is a muscle called the soleus. And notice its twitch lasts over a hundred milliseconds. However, despite how fast or slow a twitch is, a twitch all has the exact same three phases. The phases may go faster or slower, but there are three phases or three stages or three periods, whatever term you wanna use for this. All right, now let's take this graph and look, there's you know, something interesting about this graph here. Uh, and let's switch it and draw it ourselves. So now we know our goal is to talk about a twitch. Oops, doo -doo -doo. And of course we need to label our axes. So this one down here is time. And this one up here is tension. We don't have to worry too much about what the units of tension are. We just know that obviously the more tension, the higher the number is going to be. And if you looked closely at that graph that we looked before on the previous page, one of the interesting things you may have noticed is that they had this line here kind of offset from the y-axis. And this was our time zero. Now, is that usually where you put your zero on this kind of a graph offset no. a little bit? No, this is not typically why you, where you do it. The reason they've done it in this case is that this 
uh, offset zero time is because this, actually, let me change colors of that. This zero point right here is actually where we generate the muscle action potential. Since we are talking about a muscle cell and that muscle action potential is the stimulus that is going to cause the twitch, this is where the muscle action potential is. However, as we've just spent the past couple of days talking about, uh, is that you decide to contract a muscle and instantly that muscle cell produces a muscle action potential? No. No. There's all these other events that happen first, right? We make the decision. We generate a neural action potential, right? We open uh, voltage gated calcium channels in the synaptic M bulb, why we release acetylcholine, right? And yada, yada, yada. All those things that if you think about it, we're kind of in communication at the neuromuscular junction. And this was basically communication at the neuromuscular junction. All of this has to occur before we generate that muscle action potential. So where we are measuring our zero time in the muscle cell, we are acknowledging that other things need to happen first. And so that's why they've offset the zero time is because of all that stuff that has to happen before we generate a muscle action potential. Now, as we mentioned, this twitch has three phases. No, ooh, didn't want that. I want to leave that brown. I want to leave that small. I want to come over here now. And we can identify these three phases by how the tension changes. The first phase is what is called the latent phase of the latent period. And guess how the tension changes in something that is called the latent period. Do you think Wait. it's massively <laughs> increasing? Do you think it's massively decreasing? Or do you think it's not doing anything? It's not doing anything. Yeah. During the latent period, there is no change in tension. Now, this is the shortest phase. Oops. So I spell short, right? There you go. And let's go ahead and make this purple. During the latent phase, there is no change in tension. The tension stays zero. Again, this is a very short period of time. We're talking about usually one to two milliseconds. So this is a very, very short period of time. Why don't you think that there's any change in tension during this period of time? What is occurring? We've generated the muscle action potential. Why isn't the cell instantly producing tension? There you go, exactly. We have to spread that muscle action potential across the sarcolemma, down the transverse tubules, opening up, depolarizing the sarcoplasmic reticulum, opening voltage-gated calcium channels, releasing calcium, right? That calcium has to bind to the troponin, changing the shape of the troponin, moving the tropomyosin out of the way. What did we call all of that process? Contraction. 
excitation contraction coupling. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what's happening during this period of time. During this period of time, our excitation contraction coupling, and I'm just abbreviating it here, is basically happening during this phase. What is occurring is that it takes a brief period of time for us to be able to move those regulatory proteins. And that's what we have to do. We have to move those regulatory proteins. Excellent. Now, once the regulatory proteins are moved, then we can start generating tension. And does our tension instantly go to its peak? No, it's gradual. Right, absolutely. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. We are going to see, oops, an increase in tension. And this portion that is the increase in tension is what is known as the contraction phase. Now notice in the contraction phase, how is our tension changing? It's shortening. Well, it's going up, it's increasing. I am muscle, right? Yeah, so you're right. Our muscle is shortening, absolutely, but we're thinking in terms of tension. Remember in our twitch, we're able to easily identify the three phases. Oh, actually, I guess I should, since I said period for before, I should do period here as well. Phase is a perfectly acceptable term as well. We can distinguish the three phases of three periods of our twitch by how the tension changes. And in this case, the tension is changing. It is increasing. And so, of course, the question becomes, why? Why are we getting this increase in tension? What produces the tension again? Power strokes, absolutely. So it's myosin heads performing power strokes. Now, if the tension is going up, what's happening to the number of power strokes that are taking place? Are we getting more or less? More myosin heads are performing power strokes. Why? Why are there more myosin heads performing power strokes? What's allowing those power strokes to occur? More access to the actin. And what's giving them the access to the actin? The second one. Calcium. There you go, uh, absolutely, uh, right? Active sites. Exactly. There is more calcium entering the cytosol. And as more calcium enters the cytosol, we move more regulatory proteins. And as we move more regulatory proteins, more myosin heads can perform power strokes. So as a result of that, our tension in the muscle cell increases. So more calcium being available means more regulatory proteins can be moved, means more power strokes can be performed, means more tension. All right, does that make sense? So if that makes sense, hopefully this last part will make sense as well. Now, that calcium is out and about because as you guys mentioned, we're opening those voltage gated calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they are releasing that calcium uh, into the cytosol. But does that calcium stay in the cytoplasm forever, especially if we've just produced one muscle action potential? No, it gets released. Right, so what's gonna end up happening, oops. All right, so notice we are going to start putting some of that calcium away. The calcium is removed from the cytosol. 
And when calcium is removed from the cytosol, what happens to our ability to move regulatory proteins? Decreases. Yeah. And if fewer regulatory proteins are moved, what's going to happen to the number of myosin heads that can perform power strokes? They will decrease. And if all that is occurring, what's going to happen to our tension? Will also decrease. Yeah, so our tension is decreasing. Right, and we just did the Y of that. And this is our third phase or our third period of the twitch, what is called the relaxation. Notice the relaxation period is not when it reaches zero. When the cell reaches the cell reaches zero tension, the cell is now at rest. So the relaxation period isn't when it reaches zero. Whoops, no, I want that to stay there. The relaxation period, oh, I need that to be big, is when it's coming back. Oh, that's horrible. to zero when the tension is decreasing. So relaxation period is when the tension is decreasing because calcium is being put away, fewer regulatory proteins can be moved, which means fewer myosin heads can grab and pull. Notice all of the calcium is instantly put away. It takes time. So as, in, as calcium levels drop, regulatory proteins that are being moved decreases, fewer power strokes, and the cell decreases its tension until it reaches zero. And when it reaches zero, then the cell is at rest. And that is a twitch. Notice we have done this nicely on the whiteboard. Your textbooks grab like the gastrocnemius and it shows the exact same thing. Notice as we've talked about, we have the offset zero time because this is when that communication at the neuromuscular junction takes place. Because before we can generate a muscle action potential, we have to make the decision. We have to send the signal. We have to do all those things that we've talked about. So the zero time is when we produce the muscle action potential. And then notice tension doesn't increase immediately. First, we have that latent period. This is when we're moving those regulatory proteins, basically when excitation contraction coupling is occurring. As we do that, and again, as we've talked about, calcium makes cells do wonky things. During the contraction period, we have an increase in calcium. More calcium in the cytosol, meaning more regulatory proteins can be moved, meaning more power strokes can be performed meaning more tension is generated. But if we've only produced one muscle action potential, that's not gonna last for a very long period of time. The cell's not gonna stay depolarized for long. It's gonna repolarize. It's gonna close those voltage-gated calcium channels. And then just as quickly, that calcium will be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
So we have a decrease in calcium. And as that calcium is being pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the amount of calcium available goes down, the amount of regulatory proteins we move goes down, the amount of tension we produce goes down until ultimately it reaches zero. All right, questions on this. This doesn't make sense, you need to say so now because it's about to get a little bit worse. And so I wanna make sure we understand this before we make it worse. All right, this is a twitch. Again, remember the rule, one neural action potential produces one muscle action potential produces one twitch. And if on an exam, I asked you to describe a twitch, these would be the three phases uh, that we are going to talk about. However, notice as we said, even in that soleus muscle, deep in your uh, calf muscle, a single twitch only lasts a little over 100 milliseconds. This one only lasts about 40 milliseconds. And is that how we move ourselves through space? Do I lift my coffee cup in the morning because I produce one twitch in my muscle and it lifts my arm for 40 milliseconds and I have to try to get the coffee cup to my mouth during that period of time and then the muscle relaxes instantly after that? Is that how I move my body through space? No. Don't get me wrong. A quick twitch that poured hot coffee onto my face probably would do a good job of waking me up, but it wouldn't be something that I would enjoy quite as much every morning. So clearly, while this is how we produce a twitch in a muscle, just getting the muscle to twitch isn't gonna be how we move it through space. So when we're lifting that coffee cup to our face in the morning, we need to use more than one twitches. And there's one big problem with that. Let's go back to the whiteboard for this. Again, if I asked you on the uh, lecture exam to describe a twitch, if we were in the classroom, I'd actually make you draw the graph. I'm not gonna make you draw the graph on the whiteboard for this, but you do need to explain what's happening in a twitch. And if I asked you to describe the three phases of a twitch, this would be your answer. Because again, as we've talked about, one neural action potential produces one muscle action potential, which produces one twitch. But as we also just talked about, To move our body through space, we're not gonna to wanna to just use one twitch. We need to be able to produce more than one twitch. And there's one big problem with this. This one big problem as it turns out is when a muscle cell is excited, when it generates that electrical signal, When it does that, there is a brief period of time where the cell loses its excitability. Where basically no matter what we do to it, it cannot produce another action potential.
Doesn't matter what you do with it. Plug it into a light socket, hit it with a lightning bolt. It would not matter for this very brief period of time, the muscle cell loses its excitability. It loses the ability to produce a second action potential. We call this period of time the refractory period. This period of time is known as a refractory period. Now, the good news is the refractory period is only somewhere around one to five milliseconds. Remember, our latent period is somewhere around one to three. So if you think about it, this latent period, oh, what color haven't I used? Let's use orange. As soon as the muscle cell is stimulated, it can't be stimulated again for another five milliseconds, one to five milliseconds. So somewhere around here. This period of time, as I mentioned, is the refractory period. Notice the refractory period has nothing to do with this twitch. All the refractory period does is determines when we can produce a second twitch. Well, a second muscle action potential, which produces a second twitch. So notice this refractory period has nothing to do with this twitch. If I ask you to describe a twitch as an essay question, you do not have to discuss a refractory period. But if we're talking about how quickly you can produce a second one, well, that is determined by the refractory period. Does that make sense? Kind of, wait, so for clarification, if you ask us to describe a twitch, it would be the three stages latent period, contraction, relaxation period. But if you ask us, I guess, um, when we'll we can why, produce a second. So we'll see why refractory period is important in just a moment, okay? Oh, okay. We, 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 will, we will see why the refractory period is important because as we've mentioned, if I'm gonna lift my cup of coffee to my face, I'm not gonna do that with a single twitch, right? I wanna do that with a sustained contraction. And to do that sustained contraction requires multiple twitches. But can I do multiple twitches immediately, one twitch and then one millisecond later, another twitch and one millisecond later, a third twitch? No, there's gotta be a little bit of a delay and we'll see why that's important in just a minute. All right. Let's change the scale. Again, this down here is still my time. This right here is the tension I produce. And here's where we're gonna be a little bit limited by my drawing skills, but we'll do the best we can. We know that when we stimulate the muscle cell, that stimulation of the muscle cell is going to produce a twitch. And what are the three phases of a twitch? Latent phase. Or and how do we, okay, but let's do one at a time. Latent phases first. And how does the tension change during the latent phase? It doesn't just change. It stays zero, excellent. Then what happens? From the contraction, contraction complete. Contraction phase, and how does the tension change? It increases. Increases. And then what happens? Um, it starts to decrease. One. The, like, there you go, relaxation phase. Mitch has got it. And how does the tension change during the relaxation phase? Decreases. It decreases. Back to zero. And it's at zero. What do we call it when it reaches zero again? It's at rest. rest. It's at rest. Absolutely. It's now back at rest. Now, 
I twitch a muscle. I, I send one neural action potential. I produce one muscle action potential. I get one twitch. And then I wait five minutes. And in five minutes, I produce another muscle action potential. And when I generate that muscle action potential, what am I going to get as a result of that? The same thing. Yeah, I'm going to get another twitch. And, yeah. And how is the size of this twitch going to relate to the first one I produced five minutes ago? It'll be the same. It's going to be exactly the same. Now, again, with my limited drawing skills, I don't know if I can actually make it the same, but let's pretend that those were identical. You absolutely have the right idea. So five minutes later, I get an identical twitch to the first. All right. With me so far? Yeah. Okay. Again, not a useful way to move my body through space. I don't do a rapid twitch and then five minutes later, another rapid twitch, but we're getting closer to what we need. And we know that we're going to get an identical twitch five minutes later. However, do I have to wait five minutes to be able to stimulate this muscle cell again? No. No, I don't have to wait five minutes. So let's say for argument's sake, I wait for the cell to reach rest. And when it reaches rest, what is the tension at rest again? Zero. Zero, excellent. So I wait for the cell to reach, a, the, uh, to reach rest, for the tension to reach zero. And then at that point, I immediately Stimulate it again. So now once it has reached rest, I'm going to immediately stimulate it again. And when I immediately stimulate it again, what do I get? Same process. I get a twitch. But what do you think this twitch is going to look like in comparison to the previous one? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to get a twitch, but in this case, the twitch is going to be slightly bigger. I'm going to produce a little more tension. So this second twitch, oops. Still has a latent period, still has a contraction phase, and still has a relaxation phase. Back to rest, but it's a little bit bigger. And I let it go back to zero, and I stimulate it again. And what do you think is going to happen? Slightly higher. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to get a twitch that is slightly bigger than the one before. And then I stimulate it again. And again, whoops. I get a twitch that is slightly bigger than it was before. Now, this concept is what we call trepi. Trepi is a characteristic of muscle cells. And as we've just learned, the rule here is if we stimulate the muscle, immediately after it reaches resting state, and by that again we mean the tension equals zero, if we stimulate the muscle immediately after it reaches the resting state when the tension reaches zero, the resulting twitch will produce more 
attention. Now, is there going to be some maximum tension that we can produce with Treppy? Yeah. Yeah, obviously, clearly, there will be some. There clearly will be some maximal tension, at which point, if we continue to stimulate it, every twitch will produce at that point will just reach that peak. So again, there, will, there is a maximal trepi tension. But in some cases, we can do this as much as 30 times to get that increased tension. All right, we understand the definition of what a treppy is? Yes. Excellent. Could you put it into context? Like, so for example, like a I twitch, will, let's, let's just say. It's... We will, we'll get okay. there in a second. <laughs> I promise, I promise you we'll, we'll get there, right. but there's one big important question we have to answer first. Why is this occurring? What do you think's happening here? Why did we, uh, if we waited five minutes, we got a regular normal size twitch. But if we twitched it right away, we immediately got an increase in tension. Because um, it's already like sort of active. What's like, still active? Um, excitation is still, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. Okay, you're, um, you're, you're absolutely getting there. You're absolutely getting there. Now, remember, the tension equals zero. So we are not adding tension to what's already there, right? Action potential is already near or something. Close it. You're getting closer. Hold on. It doesn't have to be. But let's see if we can work our way backwards from it. What causes tension again? No, great question, Aubrey. Uh, great. We don't know we can increase tension by using more cells. But remember, trepi is a characteristic of a single muscle cell. Remember, at this point, we are still just talking about one muscle cell. We will definitely get to the point where we see more muscle cells will give us more tension. But remember, at this point, trepi is a characteristic of a single muscle cell. So this is a change in a single muscle cell. All right, we're getting there though. I like where you guys are going with this, we're getting there. So let's, let's see if we can work our way backwards from it. What produces tension? Power strokes. So clearly with this second twitch, I am performing more power strokes, right? If I have more tension, I must be performing more power strokes. So why am I able to perform more power strokes? Well, what determines how many power strokes? Say again. More energy. Okay, it could be related to energy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. What actually, I could have all the ATP in the world inside of a cell, but it could still be at rest, right? Because Where what the determines- Where the actin is lying? Say again. Where the actin is lying? How much yeah. access um, there you go. the head? The Perfect. Power, you guys all have it. Eyes. How many heads are actually able to perform the power strokes? How many binding sites? So again, performing more power strokes because that must mean that more binding sites are exposed. And what exposes the binding sites? Um, calcium. Calcium. There's more calcium in the cytosol. Let's think about this. When the cell reaches zero tension, 
let's change the color. At this point right here, when the cell reaches zero tension, the tension in the muscle cell is zero. But do you think all of the calcium has been put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? No. No. And that's the key. Even though the tension from the first twitch reaches zero, there is still residual calcium in the cytosol. So when we produce a second muscle action potential, it releases its calcium that adds to the residual calcium. So we have more calcium in the cytosol. With more calcium in the cytosol, more binding sites are exposed. We perform more power strokes. And as a result of that, we get more tension. Notice when we waited five minutes, what happened to all that residual calcium there? The calcium pump was able to get yeah. back to by me. five minutes, all the calcium is put back away. So there's no more residual calcium. So we got the same size twitch. But if we waited till just immediately when it reached zero and we stimulated again, we're able to take advantage of that increased calcium and that residual calcium gives us more tension. So then how's our max? Okay, well, so hold on. Well, so notice there is going to be a max because if there's too much residual calcium, then your tension's not gonna go back to zero. There's only so much residual calcium you can have inside the muscle cell where still the tension's gonna reach zero, right? If you have more calcium than that, then enough binding sites are gonna be exposed where you're gonna be producing tension. Okay, so, so for, I know you're gonna to get to this next, but um, for the rest, there's always going to be a max then? For I'm every, sorry? like, for like, for example, like I know there's, there's this happens too, except before like the relax, so, okay, never mind. I'm like, I'm going ahead, but basically is there always going to be a max of calcium that can be yes. um, so absolutely. produced no matter what, is, no matter well, what cycle case, or phase? Yes, in this case, with, okay. there's, a, there is a, there's a maximum amount of residual calcium you can have in a cell without having it have an effect. So there's gonna be a maximum trucking. All right. Thank All you. right. Do we understand this concept of trepi? This is a very yes. useful characteristic in a muscle cell, but again, it doesn't help me uh, lift my coffee cup because is that what I do? I make a bunch of weak contractions that each get bigger and each get bigger and each get bigger till finally I'm able to get my coffee cup to my mouth? No. 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 So clearly that's not gonna help me drink my coffee. So why is this important? Well, not too long ago, we just had the Summer Olympics, right? And in the Summer Olympics, I'm getting drips of coffee all over myself now because it's not fully empty. Um, let's think of the uh, 100 yard dash, right? One of the classic events that everybody enjoys to watch in track and field. And when those sprinters, are going up to get into their blocks to get ready to uh, sprint and try to win that gold medal? Are they moving as little as possible so they can conserve all of their energy for that burst out of the blocks to try to win? No. No. Those sprinters are constantly in motion. The whole time they're walking around, they're bouncing and jumping up and down, literally until the second they get into the blocks and they're about to fire the gun, they are moving their body. And why are they moving their body like that? So that they can get this residual calcium 
into their muscles. So when that gun goes off, they have that ability to produce that maximal tension, that maximal uh, treppy uh, twitch to generate more force as they're moving out of the blocks. So while you may not have known or understood what treppy was, we've all experienced it. We've all seen it. Those sprinters are constantly bouncing, constantly moving, constantly getting their body warm. Yes, it helps to warm up the joints. Yes, it helps to, you know, produce the synovial fluid to protect their bones. But the other thing they're doing by constantly moving around is trying to get that residual calcium into their muscles so that when the race starts, they can produce a more powerful contraction and go that much faster. So you were, Ava, you were asking earlier about a practical use for this. That is that practical use. That warming up beforehand, right? Thank you. <laughs> warm up their arm before the beginning of the game. They don't go, I only have a certain amount of ATP. I'm not going to move my arm at all until it's time to pitch for real. No, they're pitching practice once ahead of time, right? If it's a really long inning, they may be warming up or doing other things on the sideline to keep, the, yes, part of it is to keep the blood going to the muscles. Part of it is to keep the joints lubricated. But part of it is also getting that residual calcium into the muscles so they can produce more powerful contractions. So when we stretch like before, like so someone who doesn't stretch before they work out really hard and they get sore versus someone who stretches before and isn't as sore, because, is that because we've gotten those muscles ready for that type of contraction? In, 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 in the case of the soreness, that's got more to do with the use of ATP. And so the advantage of, like I said, there are other advantages to warming up to stretching ahead of time. Uh, stretching ahead of time helps us to increase blood flow. So we get more oxygen going to there, uh, increase in the circulation, helping to get rid of wastes. Like I said, it helps with the joints. It helps with those things as well. But in this case, it would also help with how much force you can produce. So when you're getting ready to lift a weight or to do a certain number of push-ups, right? Warming up a little bit first can help you to give more strength to be able to do this. Uh, no, and, and again, I know when we think of twitches, like at, we're talking about this twitch, we think of the involuntary twitches. Uh, we've all experienced a twitch. And as we know, one neural action potential produces one muscle action potential produces one twitch. There can be several things that can cause a muscle to involuntarily twitch. Uh, the two most common causes are if the nerve is irritated, because if the nerve is irritated, it may generate an action potential, which will generate a muscle action potential, which will cause the muscle to twitch. Or the other thing that can cause it is ionic imbalances. Ionic imbalances can cause the muscle to generate an action potential and generate a twitch when you're not voluntarily doing it. So those are the two most uh, common causes of twitching of the muscles, the involuntary twitch. So I, I understand like the definition of a twitch from like the standpoint of it being a neural action potential to a muscle, like it goes down. But what, like, for example, like if I'm tapping my finger, would that be a twitch? No. Like what, so what, I guess. You're contracting the muscle. This is a contraction of the muscle, right? Remember a twitch lasts, a, you know, a couple milliseconds. Is it possible to twitch a muscle? Yes, but that's not normally how we're gonna move our body through space. And even this. So then these just happen without us, like, I guess, warranting it. Like we just, it, our body just. So again, when I need to lift a weight, I need to be able to produce force in a muscle, right? And whether I'm lifting this foam ball or whether I'm lifting my phone, which is a little bit heavier, or whether I'm lifting my textbook, which is a little bit heavier, or whether I'm lifting my chair, which is a little bit heavier, or my bed, which is a little bit heavier, right? As I'm moving all of those things, I need to change how much tension is in my muscles, how much tension I'm producing in the muscles to be able to lift those different weights. Right, to do, I have to generate different amounts of forces to lift different types of objects. And this is one of the ways we can modify how much tension we're producing in a muscle cell. Because okay. that's our goal. Our goal is to move our body through space. And this is where, is where it begins. 
All right. But we're still not lifting that coffee cup to our mouth yet. We're getting there. But we need to add one more thing to this, one more characteristic of the muscle cell. Like I said, this twitch is useful. Weak twitch, slightly stronger, slightly stronger, even more stronger, even more stronger. Ma maximal twitch, maximal twitch, maximal twitch, maximal twitch. But again, that's not how I move my coffee mug to my face. Notice to see the trepi, to see that increase that is caused by the increased residual calcium, we have to let the tension go back to zero before we stimulate it again to see trepi. But do we actually have to wait for the muscle cells tension to go back to zero before we can stimulate it a second time? Yeah. No. Notice, let's draw our graph again. I generate my muscle action potential. And when I generate my muscle action potential, I produce my twitch. All right. But, and I, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Do I have to wait? So, as we know, one neural action potential gives us one muscle action potential gives us one twitch. But we don't have to wait. We do not have to wait for the tension in the muscle cell to reach zero before we stimulate it a second time. Now, can we stimulate it immediately? The second it produces that muscle action potential, can we produce a second muscle action potential? No. No, why not? The refractor period, exactly. But how long did we say that refractory period was? Like five milliseconds. Yeah, it's one to five milliseconds. So notice if we were to draw that here on our twitch, it's barely starting to produce tension at that point. So that is our refractory period. Our refractory period is this brief period of time right here. So notice, if we stimulate this muscle cell a second time after the refractory period, but before the tension reaches zero, so at this point, we generate another muscle action potential. What we can do, and I'll change the color of this, is we can add this new twitch that's going to have a latent period and then a contractile phrase and a relaxation phase. We can add that second twitch to the first one. And in fact, 
That's what this characteristic is called. This characteristic is called wave summation. In wave summation, we basically add twitches together. To get so more tension. Peak of the relaxation phase only that it can. I'm sorry. Go. So it's at the peak of relaxation where it has the ability to go higher or increase. No. But if we it can, goes any. We, we, like I said, two waves of man, I'll write this out again. Two add waves, two add waves together. Hold on way too big that's way too small to add the waves together we must stimulate the muscle cell a second time but it has to be between those two phases between the refractory period or let's say it this way we have to uh, stimulate a second time but there are two rules it has to be It must be after the refractory period. If we stimulate it during the refractory period, what happens? Nothing. Exactly. So it has to be after the refractory period, because remember, during the refractory period, it cannot be stimulated, cannot produce a muscle action potential. And it must be before the cell reaches zero tension. Why does it have to be before the cell reaches zero tension? Because it'd be at like a resting. Right, well, exactly. It'd be at zero. The yeah, tension right. is, if the tension is zero, are we adding waves together? No. No, so notice if the tension reaches zero, there's no first wave to add to. So, so it would be before this. It would be before the cell reaches zero, not before the relaxation phase. Not before the relaxation phase, before the tension reaches zero. Okay. It can be during the relaxation phase. Notice if I were to here, let's draw another one. Let's say I were to stimulate this one right here during the relaxation phase. I'm still going to get right, a latent period and then, right? And so I'm still able to add to what was there. So I'm able to add more. As long as it hasn't reached zero, I'm adding waves together. And so we have this ability to add waves together and it gets bigger and bigger. With this wave summation, we can generate much more tension oops, than from Treppy alone. We're able to add lots of tension together. Now, is there still going to be some limit? Yes. Yeah, of course. There is still going to be a maximal tension that can be produced by wave summation, but it's gonna be much, much higher than say the maximal from Treppi, right? The maximal from Treppi may be way down here. So it's gonna be so way, story. way, go ahead. Move our bodies to space? Almost. You've got the right <laughs> idea. Absolutely. So one last piece we need to add to it. Now, let's think about this. When I'm lifting this coffee mug to my lips to be able to uh, pour that coffee into my mouth, 
Do you think I want to be at the absolute maximal tension that that muscle can produce? No. So I just want to have it pegged. Is that what you do no. for those of you who work out when you go to the gym and work out? Do you always work out with the maximal weight that you can possibly use all the time? No. No. Why wouldn't you do that? We can get hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for one, but... Right. As we're going to talk about, contracting a muscle is a very powerful and also a very damaging act to the muscle. So if I'm going to lift this coffee cup, do I really want to use one muscle cell at its absolute peak to be able to do that? No. No, I'm going to use two or three muscle cells to be able to lift this to my mouth. And so typically when we contract with a normal contraction, let's say it this way. This is gonna be way too big. Typically with a normal contraction of a muscle cell, we contract it near the peak, but not to it. Instead, what we get is this undulating contraction where we're stimulating and contracting it where it is near the peak of the muscle cell. And this near peak is what we call an unfused tetanus where we get this undulating tension in that muscle cell. Now, if I'm getting that undulated tension in this muscle cell, then why isn't my hand shaking as I'm pouring that coffee into my mouth? Because it's like a sustained process. It's not okay, well, let's also think of it this way. Let's really say... Again, I know most of you aren't on camera and some of you may actually be asleep, but what if I told you that I would give you four points of extra credit if you would sing a Taylor Swift song in a solo all by yourself right now? How many of you would be willing to do that for four points of extra credit? All the points I can get. Yeah. How many? <laughs> four points of extra credit for an entire Taylor Swift song solo all by yourself. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Okay. notice one or two people might be willing to do it but there are also there you go crystal wants 50 right absolutely <laughs> so there's there's definitely some hesitation however what if i said if all of you sang together and i would give you four points for singing the taylor swift song together how many would you be willing to swing in a choir for four points of extra credit probably a lot yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Why? What's the difference? Because we're not really singled out. We're all right. Kind of when, you, all together. when you sing in a choir, it all fuses together. And it's the exact same thing when I'm lifting this coffee mug. I'm lifting this coffee mug, even though this coffee mug doesn't weigh a whole heck of a lot. I'm using multiple cells to lift it. And while each one of those individual cells is using an unfused tetanus, the same way your voice may fluctuate uh, when you try to sing that Taylor Swift song, right? If you're all singing together, it all kind of melds together into a smooth, uniform sound. If on the other hand, you're trying to do an activity that only uses a couple muscles, like you're trying to thread that needle, what happens when you're trying to thread that needle? It's shaky. Yeah, and then your hand shakes a little bit more. You see that unfused tetanus because when you're singing in a solo or a duet, it's harder to hide those bad notes, right? And so when you're only doing that, or take it the other side, if instead of lifting a coffee mug, I was trying to lift, right, a couch and hold it up, or a car and hold it up, what happens to your muscles when you're holding at that high weight? You start to get that Shake. vibration, that shaking of the muscles. The shaking of the muscles is because you're to try to produce enough tension, you're firing all the muscle cells at the same time 
And when they're all firing at the same time, then you get that uh, shaking contraction. Now, is it possible to get the muscle cell to contract at the peak? Oops, all right, that was horrible. I'll cheat. Not at, but maybe near. So no, I'm saying at. Is it possible to get the muscle cell to contract at the peak level? What do you think? Yes, probably. Yeah. It turns out you can, and that would be what we would call a complete or a fused tetanus. But this is typically not how we use the muscles. Why wouldn't we want to use the muscles this way? Damaging. Yeah, because it could be more damaging. Absolutely, you're doing. Uh, however, if I were to grab onto an electric fence, right, where I grab that electric fence and that electrical si signal is going up my arm, what's going to happen to all my muscles at that point? They're going to fry. Well, okay, yes, <laughs> but it's also going to cause, are you able to let go of that wire when you start oh. to fry? No. no, because it's stimulating all the muscles and all the muscles are contracting at that maximal amount. So it can be That's more damaging. horrible. Yes, it is horrible. So I'm, I'm not encouraging you to grab onto an electric fence. But are there other instances we hear stories of grandmas lifting cars off of babies? Right. How are they able to do that? Right. Because in that extreme adrenaline situation, they're able to get their muscles to uh, contract at their maximal. Or in other cases, muscles can be trained that way. As I mentioned, right, your hand tends to shake when you and I, these common people, try to thread a needle. But that neurosurgeon, when he's doing that neurosurgery, do you want his hand shaking while he's doing your neurosurgery? I can just no. get in yeah. something there in your brain. No, absolutely not. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, so it's something that can be practiced. In fact, when I, again, I'm a neuroscientist by trade. When I was in grad school, one of the things that our, uh, my PI, primary investigator, the, the, the uh, instructor that I worked with would have us do is you would have a mason jar with, two, with a dice, with a die, a single die inside of it and some suture. And using forceps, you had to go into the jar and you had to tie the suture around the die. So we practice to, again, smooth out those muscle movements. So it is possible with the fine muscle movements to learn it. It can be a learned behavior. You can learn to smooth it out. Um, and again, uh, we see it at that peak strength, but we don't commonly uh, use that fused tetanus because it does run the risk of being potentially damaging to the muscles to use them. Because as we'll see, contracting a muscle is a very powerful, impactful thing. Having that myosin grab and pull on the actin and pulling on all those proteins and pulling on all that connective tissue can be very damaging. And so we want to limit the damage. So typically we use this unfused tetanus. And again, if you don't like my pictures, we have the pretty pictures from your textbook. Notice we talked about trepi. Again, limits. Uh, it has to be immediately, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately after uh, the cell reaches zero tension. But Remember, it also has to be after, oh, I didn't have that here. I should have that here. It must be after the refractory period. So as long as it occurs between those times, we can uh, add the twitches together, and uh, not add to the twitches, but add to the uh, residual calcium to increase the amount of tension to some maximal trepi. And we don't have to wait till the tension reaches zero. If we stimulate it before the tension reaches zero, after the refractory period, 
then we can add the waves together, wave summation. Again, in most cases with most muscles, we get to that unfused or incomplete tetanus where we get those undulations in contraction and relaxation tension near the peak, producing that wavering and sustained contraction. But we also have the ability to produce, if needed, a complete tetanus, a smooth, sustained contraction at peak. But this is not typically how we're going to want to move our body through space because of the potential of it being damaging to the muscle cell. All right. Questions on that? So if these were asked as essay questions, they'd be separate, not together, because they really don't have anything. They don't really correlate together in the yeah, sense Yeah, no, that... I mean, I guess okay. both, both can increase the tension in a single muscle cell, right? Notice right. we've gone from just seeing how the proteins interact. And then from there, we went to see what happens, the events of a sarcomere. From there, we talked about how we change the tension in the sarcomere or looked at things from the myofibril. Now, we have now talked about how our, we can change the tension in a single muscle cell. And now, from here, the next place we're going to go is now we'll talk about groups of muscle cells. And from there, we can go to fascicles. And from there, we can go to complete muscles. And so again, as we've talked about, we broke it all down to the basic pieces, and now we're building it back up again. So at this point, we are now done with a single muscle cell. We understand now how a single muscle cell works. So what we'll do at the beginning of the next class is put these muscle cells together into groups and see how they work together in groups. All right, so yes, so we've slowly been building back up. And yeah, definitely uh, trepi and wave summation both involve tension, both involve a single muscle cell, but I think that they would be separate essay questions because they're obviously different processes. Right. All righty, questions on that? All right, excellent. We are now ready for our second break. And when we come back from our second break, where is, oh, I didn't open it. It is time to move on to our origins and insertions and actions. We left off last time. Uh, with those that affected our trunk. So we are on to the muscles that affect and move our arm through space. So we will start that today. We won't finish it today, but we'll start this today. Finish it and start the leg on Wednesday. And then on Monday, we finish the leg. And just like that, we're done. So let's go ahead and take our next break. It is 1019, so we'll call that 1020. Uh, so I don't have to do any complicated math. So we'll come back at 1035 and we will restart during this time. Grab your red pens, grab your blue pens, grab your handouts, and I will see you back here in 15 minutes. Any questions? All right, see you after the break. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. Got all our files up and ready. So, as I mentioned, we are moving on to the muscles that affect and move our arm through space. 
And as we've already mentioned a couple times, one of the most obvious examples of this is the biceps brachia. It is the superficial muscle on the anterior part of the body. And one of the important things to remember when we are talking about the appendages is anterior muscles do what? What do all anterior muscles do? Flex. Yeah, anterior muscles flex, whereas posterior muscles then do what? Extent. Now, that is a very good, useful, important rule, but can we really use it 100% of the time? No. Are there any exceptions? What's the one exception? Is it the latissimus dorsi? Okay, not a bad, <laughs> not a bad guess. Um, but remember, that's not one of the muscles that moves the arms. The Tricep middle. brachii. Right. Okay. But no. So I think I see where you guys are going. But no, think of it this way: In the exception. What joint doesn't work the way all the other joints do? Us. Yeah. The knee. The knee, exactly. Oh, wow. So, okay. <laughs> uh, muscles that are anterior on the knee are going to extend the knee. Uh, posterior muscles that affect the knee are going to flex the knee. So the one exception are the muscles that move the knee. Those are the only ones that are going to be backwards. But luckily, the knee is on the lower part of the body. So anytime we're on the appendages, the upper arms, the upper limbs, we know that... Um, it is going to flex. And so again, it is important to look at where the origins and the insertions are for these. So let's switch to our bone handout and let's make this a little bigger. Excellent. Now, biceps brachia, of course, means what? Two head heads. Two headed oh. in the uh, upper arm region. And if we have two heads, what else do we have? Two bellies. Two bellies or two heads or two bellies. That means that we have two origins. Excellent. So this is one of those cases where we want to be specific. So let's be specific. What is, what are the two heads? What are the two bellies? The short head is the coracoid process. Well, let's not worry about even, you, you will get, you're absolutely, that is absolutely correct, but right, one is the short head and then the other head. is what? The long, long head. head. Long head, excellent. But you are also absolutely correct in that the origin of the short head was what? The coracoid process. Yeah, the coracoid process. So right here is the origin of the short head. And what is the origin of the long head? The supraglenoid um, tubercle. The supraglenoid tubercle, absolutely, which would be found up here. This one can be a little tricky when you look at it in a uh, model. Uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to lose this as soon as I do that, but it's all right. It's worthwhile. We go to our virtual anatomy lab. We go to the muscular system. We go to the arm. Uh, that's not a great view. Oh, these are crummy pictures. All right. This is probably the best picture of this, uh, but let's go ahead and divide this up. I bet the picture is on your master, uh, your, uh, your, uh, my lab and mastering the personal anatomy lab are probably better, but we'll start here. We can clearly see that there is a division between the two bellies. 
And what I wanted to show you on this is that what can be tricky is this one here may be the one that appears to be long because we see its tendon. The long and short heads usually don't have as much to do about the heads as they do with their tendons. Whereas when you look at the model, this lateral belly over here, it disappears a little bit. In fact, if we switch to the picture before, we see that here is the long head of the bicep break and it hides underneath the deltoid. But even if you remove the deltoid, you wouldn't be able to see it very well as uh, either. And the reason for that, I think is shown best in the illustration in your textbook. Notice here we see the two bellies. Here's our dividing point. Here's belly one out here on this side and here's belly two out here on this side. And notice the tendon for the short belly goes directly up and connects to the coracoid process of the scapula. We see this entire tendon. Whereas notice the tendon of the outer one is much longer. It travels up the intertubercular sulcus, that groove between the two tubercles of the humerus. It goes up over the head of the humerus. It actually goes into the shoulder joint all the way across until it finally attaches to that rough bump on top of the scapula. So notice this lateral belly is the long belly with a much longer tendon. Its tendon is more hidden. We don't see all of it like we do the short, but the short head, we see all of that short tendon. That lateral long belly goes all the way up the humerus, over the head of the humerus, all the way to the scapula. So the long head has a longer tendon. And that's what we see when we draw these here as well. So again, I'll draw them again. Our short head, we put here on the coracoid process. And the origin of the long head is that supraglenoid tubercle, that bump on the top of the scapula. And that is the origin of the long head. Excellent. Two bellies, two heads, two origins, but how many insertions? One. One. And what is the one insertion for the bicep brachia? The common tendon into the radial tuberosity. Right. And again, all we have to put is radial tuberosity. The common tendon is just there to remind you that while they have two separate origins, they come together into a single tendon, into a single insertion point. So you, if you, there's nothing wrong with saying common tendon, but you don't have to learn common tendon. It's just a reminder that they come together into the same uh, insertion. So again, we have this lateral belly out here, long head, lateral, short head, medial, and they come into a common tendon into the radial tuberosity. So will they always be together? Like we wouldn't just show us a model, like the first picture, for example, it's really hard to tell. Would it be in context? Mm. Yeah, let's look at the master and AMP and see what that looks like. See if it gives us a better picture there. Because obviously the textbook picture from your class, from, 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 the, from, the, from the textbook is a good picture. But let's see that picture from the, from the, Virtual anatomy lab is crummy. So let's see what our my lab and mastering shows us. Uh, 
All righty. Uh, practice anatomy lab. Open the practice anatomy lab. Anatomical models, muscular system, upper limb. You guys are all seeing this, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Is that it? Well, that's not very good either. All right. Well, it's not ideal, uh, but uh, luckily there are models in the classroom and there are better pictures in other places that you can find. Notice here is our bicep brachia. Yes, so we see that there. So I guess so, just we can know that yeah, like since it's ideally, lateral. And... Ideally, the, the two muscles are side by side. So when you look at the bicep brachia straight on, you can see those two individual bellies side by side that way. Here, we can tell them by context. And this is kind of what I was getting at before. Notice clearly, even though this is bicep brachia here, this is, uh, we are looking at the um, medial side of the arm. So again, the medial side of the arm, that is going to be the short head that we're seeing coming up here, uh, up towards that. And then that other view, this is clearly the lateral head. So this would be the long head. So the, none, none of these pictures do a great job, but there are pictures I'm sure you can find online. And also if you get in the classroom, uh, you'll get to play with the models. I will give you an obvious example where you can clearly see the two bellies are side by side, but they're two superficial bellies sitting side by side in the arm that is pretty easy to distinguish that way. All right, so none of these pictures do a great job of showing that, but there are others that will. So you've got these two bellies, the short head over here, or short belly, either one's fine. The long over here, oops, that was horrible. So I can cheat and grab it, move it. So one nice thing that I can do on this that I can't do on the whiteboard. So there we go, this two bellies side by side, the long is lateral. We've done their origins up there on the scapula, up here on the scapula, and they both insert into the radial tuberosity. Now, as we talked about before, it is important to see how many joints this crosses. How many joints does the bicep brachia cross? Two, excellent, perfect. Thank you, Mitch. There are two, the shoulder and the elbow. So an obvious action, what is the obvious action of the shoulder? being an anterior muscle. Flexes. Flexes the arm or flexes the shoulder. Crossing the elbow, what is the obvious action? Flex the forearm or flex the elbow. Remember, you, you can either identify the joint or the part of the body that moves. So those are the two obvious actions. However, remember, we have this special ability of the forearm to rotate my hand or turn my hand so that my hand faces backwards. That is not a rotation. What action was that? Well, to turn it backwards, to point backwards, that would be mm. the opposite one. This is supination. Bringing my hand to point forward is pronation. supination. Turning my hand to point back is pronation. And if you remember when we talked about the bones, in this pronation and supination, the ulna doesn't move and the radius does. The radius is the bone that twists over the ulna while it stays still. So notice if a muscle attaches to the ulna, it cannot pronate and supinate. But if one attaches to the movable bone, the radius, it can pronate and supinate. And notice the biceps brachia attaches to the radius, the movable bone. So what is the third action 
of the bicep brachia? It rotates. Uh, well, but again, remember, we don't call it a rotation. So supinate. it's it would supinate. It turns the hand outward. All right. Remember, we talked about doing the curls for the girls. All right. Getting that nice big bicep brachia. How do you do that? You have to supinate the forearm, right? You flex the elbow. And if you're really working hard, you're going to flex the shoulder as well. So those are the actions of that bicep brachia. It supinates the arm and then flexes. Now, if you think about it, if you're curling, doing lifting weights and curling, can you lift more when you're supinated or can you lift more when you're pronated? Supinated. Supinated, pronated. right? Because when you pronate, you're actually kinking the tendon of the bicep brachia and you're not able to easily engage the bicep brachia. Whereas when you're supinated, you can easily engage the bicep brachia and you can curl much more weight. However, you can still curl some weight when you're pronated. So clearly there must be other muscles that flex your elbow. And that's where we're gonna go next. All right, so questions on the bicep brachia. All right, the bicep brachia is the muscle that gets all the credit. But deep to the bicep brachia is a muscle right underneath it, a broad flat muscle right underneath the bicep brachia called the brachialis muscle. Its belly sits right underneath the bicep brachia. Does that mean it does the exact same thing as the bicep brachia? No. No, not necessarily, right? To know what it does, we have to draw its origins and insertions. So let's do that. What is the origin of the brachialis? The front just so hot. Yeah. So basically... the front distal portion of the humerus. And what is its insertion? Coronary process of the ulna. Oh, the ulna, there you go. And capsule of the elbow joint. Yeah, yeah, but that. We just care about the bone. We don't have to put that then. <laughs> you don't have to put that. Okay. All right. So. Notice this sits right underneath the biceps brachia, but how many joints does it cross? One. Just one, just the elbow. And notice on the forearm, does it attach to the movable bone or the stable bone? Stable. Stable. So can this pronate or supinate? No. No. Can this affect the shoulder? No. No. So how many actions does the brachialis have? One. one. Just one. And being an anterior muscle, what is that one action on the forearm or on the elbow? Flexes. Yeah. Flexes the elbow. There you go. Like I said, the bicep brachia gets all the credit because it's sitting there on top, but the brachialis is right underneath. Now, there is one interesting thing about the brachialis. The brachialis is a deep muscle. And even though we haven't talked about it yet, uh, as you may have hinted at or seen, the deltoid muscle comes and basically inserts right where the brachialis is. Notice we see that here in our illustration. In our illustration, we can see here is that deep brachialis. And here we can see the cut deltoid muscle coming right to it. But notice another place where we can really see it is on that model. 
Notice here we have that big triangle shaped arrowhead of the deltoid and it puts points right at the brachialis. Notice if we look at the picture from your uh, my lab, the practice, in, uh, the practice anatomy lab. Notice the deltoid is an arrow that points right at the brachialis muscle. And because they embrace, they share an attachment point, no matter how big that brachialis gets, no matter how big that deltoid gets, no matter how big that arm gets, the deltoid always points right at the brachialis. Now notice he's got his arm twisted forward. So that's why this lateral structure we can see from the front. But notice we can clearly see three distinct bellies on the lateral aspect of the arm. The lateral head, that long head of the bicep brachia. This is the lateral head of the tricep brachia, which we'll talk about later. And this muscle in between, what must that be? That the deltoid is pointing right at? Brachialis. Brachialis. So notice even though the brachialis is a deep muscle, it is a muscle that easily can be identified on our bodybuilders. And so it absolutely is one of the muscles you'll be responsible for on our bodybuilders. Yes. That's, it sounded like someone was about to say something. No? All righty. Excellent. Questions on this? I do have a question just regarding the muscles in general. Yeah. So do we need to know like the shapes or I guess the general shapes of all the muscles or just the four major ones that you went over? You need to know the four major ones, but I'm, when I'm pointing at the brachialis, do you need to know what it is? No. 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 What's the most common one? So what is it most likely going to be? Oof, I don't know. <laughs> parallel is parallel remembers the most common style, but no. Okay. You don't need to know the style. You need to know one example that I've given you of each of the four uh, shapes, but you don't need to know the shape of every muscle on your list. It's not on your list that way. It's not. Right. Okay. It, it's it's useful if it helps you to understand how the muscle moves, but it's not required. I'm not going to ask you what is the shape of the brachialis muscle. Okay, thank you. Yep. No, it's a great question. All right. That is two, but there are actually three muscles that flex the elbow. We've done the bicep brachia and we've done the brachialis and notice they're both on the upper part of the arm. So that's why it's a little surprising when we see the third muscle that flexes the elbow. It is the brachioradialis. And notice it is a muscle located on the forearm. Most of the forearm muscles move our hand, move our wrist, move our fingers. And so this looks like that would be one of the muscles. However, when we draw the origins and insertions, we'll see that that is indeed not the case. So what is the origin of the brachioradialis? The lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus. There you go, the lateral supracondylar ridge. Not the epicondyle, but that raised ridge above it on the humerus. A number of the, one of those dumb looking bone features, you're like, why do I have to learn this? This seems silly. Well, now you know. It's because it's an attachment point for the brachioradialis. Excellent. What is its insertion? The styloid process of the radius. Yeah, the styloid process of the radius. Notice. Even though this muscle is found on the forearm, it does not reach to the hand. It does not cross the wrist. So it does not move the fingers. It does not move the hand. It does not move the wrist. It only crosses one joint. And what's the one joint it crosses? The elbow. The elbow. And being an anterior muscle, what is the number one action of this muscle going to be? 
flexing? Flexing, absolutely. Now, is it on the stable ulna or does it insert into the movable radius? Movable radius. Movable radius. So what does it do? Does it pronate or does it supinate? So do both. Both? Can a muscle actually do both? Do you have a muscle of your arm that both flexes and extends your elbow or flexes and extends your shoulder or no. flexes and extends your hands? No. No. But does this muscle both pronate and supinate the forearm? I don't know. Well, yes. you had the list in front of you, so you should be able to figure it out. Yeah, it yes. does. That doesn't seem to make sense until you think about what this muscle actually does, right? We keep talking about being in anatomical position. And when you're in anatomical position, is this how you wait for the bus with your hand in anatomical position, just standing there upright, feet pointing forwards, palm facing forwards, and this is how you stand waiting for the bus? No. no. Anybody do that that way? No. You, people are slowly going to move away from you while you're standing there. No, typically, when we wait for a bus, when we stand waiting for a bus, we do it in what we call body neutral position. And body neutral position is actually where your thumb faces forward. And that's what this muscle does. This muscle puts our arm into body neutral position. So notice if I'm in anatomical position, it has to pronate my hand to bring it to body neutral. If I'm already pronated, it has to supinate my hand to bring it to body neutral position. So no matter where my hand is, it's going to bring it to body neutral. And so that's how it can both right, supinate and pronate because it has that ability to be do that. Now, there are several ways we can take advantage of this. One of the easy ways to see your brachioradialis is to flex your elbow, go up to the table that you're at right now, put your hand under the table. And as you put your hand, your thumb with your thumb up, I don't know if you can see that, with your thumb up under the table, push up. And when you push up, you actually make your brachial radialis stand out. That brachial radialis is the one that lines right up with your thumb. And so when you push up, you make that brachial radialis stand out. That is your brachial radialis. That is your forearm muscle. And its job is to put it into body neutral position. And of course, as you know, the goal of all muscles is to woo women. And of course, the brachial radialis is how I wooed my wife because there I was at the bar, saw her against the dance floor. And of course I busted out my best dance moves. And of course my best dance move includes doing the robot. And of course to do the robot, you have to have your hand in body neutral position and then you flex your arm. And as you're flexing your arm in body neutral position, right? Doing the robot, she just swooned. All right, questions on that. Now, notice, as I mentioned, by putting pressure on it, you can make that brachioradialis stand out. I showed you how you can do that for yourself underneath the table. But if you also think about it, this is a very, very common bodybuilder pose. One of the classic bodybuilder poses, you see them pushing down on their hand. Now notice, She's cheating a little bit here because notice her hand is turned outward. And we know the brachial radialis is going to line up with her thumb, right? Often they have it this way and they push down, making it stand out. She's turning it a little bit. So it does look like it's coming a little bit more anteriorly, but that's because she has her hand and her arm twisted. But it's still that classic pose, the very, very classic bodybuilder's pose that they use to make that brachial radialis stand out prominently. This is useful because it's easy to see and identify. And also, uh, where are we, Tom? We probably won't get to the forearm today, but I find the forearm is the trickiest part of the body for students when it comes to the muscles. Not because they're particularly hard. They're, 
there are actually a ton of muscles in your forearm, but you're only responsible for six forearm muscles, three on the front, three on the back. So it's a bit easy, but much like when you get to a new location, right? You move to a new area, right? You use your work or you use your home as kind of an anchor point. And from that anchor point, you're able to explore out and find the things. And we'll be able to do that as well. If we find that brachioradialis, we find the thumb and we find that brachioradialis, then from the brachioradialis, we'll be able to explore out and we'll easily be able to find the six muscles of the forearm that you're gonna be responsible for. So it's gonna be a good important anchor point for us to help us to learn the forearm as well. All right, questions on that? All right, those are the three big flexors of our, uh, of our arm. Let's talk about one of the muscles we just mentioned, the deltoid. The deltoid muscle is a very comfy, cozy muscle because it is that cream filling in the Oreo wedged in between all of the other two other muscles snuggled in between. What is, let's go ahead and draw it on here first, then we'll draw it on the bones. What is the origin of the deltoid? Chromial end of the clavicle. Chromial spine end of the clavicle. And the spine, absolutely. So the spine of the scapula, the acromium of the scapula, and the acromial end of the clavicle. Like a C up here on the front. Why do those three bone features sound familiar? Trapezius. Yeah, notice that is exactly where the trapezius inserts. The trapezius and the deltoid, remember I used that term before, embrace. Where one inserts, the next originates. And as you can see, what is the insertion of the deltoid? The deltoid tuberosity. That deltoid tuberosity, that roughened attachment point on the lateral aspect of the humerus. And remember, this is also basically, again, we're from the back, so it's a little tricky, but this is basically where the brachialis sits. So where the brachialis originates is basically, remember we know the deltoid points right at the brachialis. And so it basically embraces the trapezius and it embraces the brachialis. So it's nice and wedged, comfy, cozy in between those two muscles. So remember, <clears throat> this is one of those times where it's gonna be important on the exam to pay attention. If I have a nice big fat arrow pointing to the spine of the scapula, you can't just instantly write deltoid. You have to read the question. Because notice with this arrow, there's two questions I could ask. Identify the muscle that originates from this bone feature. And what would you say to that? Deltoid. Deltoid. But I could also say identify the muscle that inserts into this bone feature. And what would you say for that? Trapezius. Trapezius, absolutely. So again, as I've said many, many times, we'll continue to say, people lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. This is especially one of those uh, tests where that can happen, right? I could have that arrow and I could have it pointing to this muscle right here and everybody gets all excited because I know what that is. That is the deltoid. But remember, there's basically four, mus uh, four questions I could ask. Yes, I could ask you to identify the muscle, but I could also ask you to identify its origin. I could also ask you to identify its insertion. And what's the fourth question I can ask? Action. Action. Actions. And what is the action of the deltoid? Abducts. Yeah, let's start there. Anterior muscles flex. The deltoid is basically a lateral muscle. 
So what's the most obvious action of a lateral muscle? Laterally flexing. And that's not laterally. a lateral flex. What is that? Laterally. Abduct. Yeah, abduct. Abduct brings it out. So abduct is the most obvious example of what its action is going to be. Lateral muscles, abduct. Bring the arm away from the body. Abducts the arm from the bottom. But this is a C-shaped muscle where some of the fascicles are on the front and some of the fascicles are on the back. And if I just flexed these fascicles on the front, it would twist my humerus so that the anterior part moved towards the midline. And what action would that be? What action was that? Oh, if only I had the list of actions for the muscles in front of me, it would be so easy for me to answer these questions. There you go, a medial rotation. If I just flexed the fascicles in the back, it would turn my humerus so that the anterior part went away from the midline. And what would we call that? Lateral rotation. Lateral rotation. So there's three yep. actions. Yep. And so three actions, exactly. An easier way to see this is actually to start with the arm abducted. I spent God, so many years in Davis. I did my undergraduate at Davis. I did some postgraduate work in Davis, and then I went to graduate school in Davis. So I spent more time in Davis than any uh, sane individual should have to spend. And for any of you who have spent any time in Davis or gone to Davis or been in Davis, one of the things that all people in Davis are required by law to do is every single person in Davis must spend at least two hours riding their bike on the streets. All right, it's required. If you live in Davis, you have to do it. And so, of course, when you're out there, you need to know how to do your hand signs when you're on your bike. So notice my arm is already abducted. And if you watch my humerus instead of my forearm, notice when I tell everybody I am going to stop, my humerus rotates and the anterior part is coming towards the midline. So that was a medial rotation. If I wanna tell everybody I'm turning, notice my humerus laterally rotates. So the medial, and lateral rotation of the humerus while it's abducted. So everybody in Davis has massive deltoid muscles, right? Technically only on their left arm from signing because you only do the signaling on your left arm. But when you have to spend two hours a day on a bicycle and you have to be signing, you can tell someone from Davis because they all have massive deltoid muscles in their left arm. All right. So those are the three actions of the deltoid. Questions on that? All righty, excellent. So that is the deltoid muscle. Let's look at the next muscle. The latissimus. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, for the origin, do we need to specify to do that it embraces the insertion of the trapezius no. or is it just extra Remember, information? Terms like common tendon, terms like the joint capsule, terms like embraces, those are put there to help you to understand their relationships. That is a reminder to you that basically both the trapezius and the deltoid have this exact same bone features as their attachment point. So that's just a reminder to you. So it's not wrong to put it. And if it helps you to remember it, that's great, but I'm not gonna mark you off if you leave it off. Okay, what I care about are the bone features, the spine, the acromion, the lateral third of the clavicle. All right. All right, excellent. Any other questions on the deltoid? Can we draw it on the bones? What? We didn't draw, like we did it on oh, here yeah. on the model, but we didn't do it on the bones. You are correct. We can do that. And notice conveniently enough, 
we put this one. Uh, oh, it's on the second page, isn't it? We put this one with the trapezius. So because they share an attachment point, if we were to do this here, we already have the trapezius drawn. And so our origin is again, the spine, the acromion, and the lateral third of the clavicle. And what was the insertion again? The acromion end of the clavicle spine. And well, the, the insertion, what is not, not of the trapezius, of the uh, deltoid. Deltoid tuberosity. Deltoid tuberosity, there you go. There you go. Which is why we put on the same one, because again, for our trapezius, remember we had our trapezius origin all the way down here, and then it inserted where the deltoid begins, they embrace. All right, excellent. Any other questions on the deltoid? All right, perfect. Latissimus dorsi looks similar to the trapezius, and in some ways it is similar. It is a superficial muscle. It is, however, on the inferior portion of the back. And like the trapezius, it is mostly posterior. Of course, what's the key word there? Mostly. Mostly. Remember the trapezius sneaks a little onto the front with its insertion and our latissimus dorsi does the same thing. They both have big, broad uh, posterior origins but their insertions both sneak onto the anterior side. So this is one where we definitely want to draw the origins and the insertions. So let's take a look at this and draw our origins and insertions of the latissimus dorsi. So let's start first with the origin. What is the origin of the latissimus dorsi? Arthrosa lumbar fascia. Okay. Which is that big white uh, fascia we know. What else? I can't really draw that, but what else? The spines of the lower six thoracic vertebrae. Okay. So that's T12, T11, T10, T9, T8, and T7. What else? And the lower three ribs, three or four ribs. Okay. About here on the ribs a little bit. What else? Um, the crest of the ilium and the sacrum. Okay. There's the crest of the ilium. Here's the crest of the sacrum. What else? And then the inferior angle of the scapula. Inferior angle of scapula. We're missing something, aren't we? Um, the lumbar vertebrae? Yeah. Don't forget the lumbar vertebrae. Notice basically it is the spinous processes of T7 through L5. All right. Then we have the crest of the sacrum. Oops, what are we doing? All the way down. And then the crest of the ilium, the ribs, and the even the inferior angle of the scapula. So notice starting here, oops, no. We have all these fascicles from all these different locations, all broadly coming together. A big, huge, massive, broad origin. But all of them come together into one single insertion. And what is that one single insertion? Um, the 
Intertubercular sulcus. Intertubercular um, sulcus, absolutely. Notice which side of the bone is the inter, intertubercular sulcus on? Medium. It's on the anterior side, right? Notice here we see the two tubercles. And so we could cheat if we wanted and put our origin for the uh, latissimus dorsi there. We could also cheat and put a dotted line here to remind us and maybe right anterior to remind us that it's on the anterior side. But basically this comes up underneath and grabs onto the humerus from the underside. So Are we able to put two, um, T7 through L5? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. The spinous processes of T7 through L5 okay. would be a fine way to describe that. So we see this really nicely here in the illustration. Questions on the drawings before I change, because you know as soon as I leave, the drawings go away. So any questions on the drawings of the origins and insertions before we look at this? You just said that it just wraps around underneath the humor. Exactly, and that's what I wanted to show you. Okay. So notice here when we look at the illustration from the textbook, we can see some of the fascicles coming off of the ilium, many of them coming from the spinous processes. Notice it's stabilized by the thoracolumbar fascia, some coming across and even some in coming from the inferior angles. But notice it's all going towards the front of the arm. And where we actually see this best is going to be back here on our, oops, in our uh, virtual anatomy lab at Cosumnes River College for the muscular system. If we look at that, oh, they don't have the chart here, do they? I don't think, hold on, where did we have the chart? Hold on, I showed you guys the chart last time. Oh, I know where we have it. So again, here is the illustration from your textbook. And notice if we look at the chart that's in the classroom, we can actually see that latissimus dorsi muscle coming off of the back and actually coming up and inserting into the anterior part of the humerus. So we can see how it actually wraps around and comes up into this. This is that big, broad muscle that comes out. Who has big, prominent latissimus dorsi muscles? Not me. <laughs> okay, maybe not you, but who does? Bodybuilders. Bodybuilders, true, but even more than bodybuilders. Football players? I don't know, just kidding. <laughs> well, let's see, okay. Let's see if we can figure out the actions. What are the actions of the latissimus dorsi? Extend, adduct, and medially rotate arm. Excellent. Sounds like a baseball player. Baseball player is an excellent example of this. So we have this big, huge. Large origin, 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 origin. Notice, so again, I work this out for myself easily. This has a medial insertion and a lateral, uh, I mean, pardon me, a medial origin and a lateral insertion. So the most obvious action is going to bring the arm in. And what would bringing the arm in be? 
A deduct. A deduction. Absolutely. There you go. You got it. Swimmers. Um, it is a posterior muscle. So what's the most obvious example on the shoulder? Rotate. Well, again, yeah, posterior, posterior muscles do what? Extend. Extend. So medial muscles adduct, right? Posterior muscles extend. However, this one sneaks up under the arm onto the anterior part of the humerus. So when it pulls on the humerus, it is going to medially rotate it. And as I didn't see who wrote it, as Mitch pointed out, if you think about a swimmer, the swimmer, that's what they do. When they're taking that big stroke in the water, they're bringing their arm in, they're bringing their arm back, and they're medially rotating, right? If they do both at the same time, they're doing the butterfly. If they're alternating, they're doing the freestyle. So that bringing the arm down and in, so when you look at someone like you know, Michael Phelps, Michael Phelps basically has bat wings, right? Where we can see his latissimus dorsi coming out to the sides as he's doing that. So he, again, very prominent, powerful swimmer. So he has very pronounced latissimus dorsi. And as we've learned since, he also has a very well-developed sternocleidomastoid. All right, questions on that. So we have that nice bat wing, bringing the arm in, bringing the arm back, and medially rotating it. Does this one make sense? Yes. Okay, excellent. If that one makes sense, then we can look at the next one. Here from the anterior side, we can see the trapezius sneak, uh, pardon me, the latissimus dorsi sneaking up to the front. But notice we also have this big, broad muscle here, the pectoralis major. The pectoralis major surprisingly shares a big characteristic with the latissimus dorsi. So let's draw the pectoralis major. What is the origin of the pectoralis major? Clavicle. All right, excellent, clavicle. Sternum. Sternum. Again, guys, you should have your list right in front of you and be reading this off. So it should be easy. Excellent. A little bit of the cartilages of ribs one through six. And what else? Aponeurosis of external oblique muscle. Yeah, remember we have that. No, next, let's do it this way. That Aponeurosis of the external oblique is going to be an attachment point for it as well. Notice it has this big, huge C-shape origin. And you may not have thought of it in those terms, but you're aware of it because when our bodybuilder works out this pectoralis major, does it go wider? Does it go, you know, does it go wider? Does it go taller or does it stick right out? Sticks right out. Sticks right out because notice there's nowhere else for it to go. It's so locked in place by its origin. Really, the only way when it grows, it can grow is it can grow out, giving them those big prominent pectoralis major muscles. Now, notice that doesn't sound anything like the latissimus dorsi, but what is the origin? Pardon me, what is the insertion of the pectoralis major? Intertubercular succulus of the humerus. Yeah, notice both the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi have the exact, oops, have the exact same insertion. They both insert into that groove on the anterior side of the humerus, which is why I suggest you draw that latissimus dorsi insertion on the pectoralis major picture to remind you that these two sit side by side. So as uh, someone pointed out last time, on the exam, if I show you a humerus like this one here, and I have an arrow and I point the arrow to that location, 
and I ask you to identify the two muscles that insert into this bone feature, what's your answer to that going to be? Latissimus dorsi major. There you go, the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi. Excellent. Now, this shared or, uh, insertion gives it some similar actions. Notice again, medial muscle with a medial origin and a lateral insertion. So with that medial origin, what is the obvious action it's going to have on the arm? Duct, duct, bringing it in. Notice because it also attaches to the anterior surface, it is going to medially rotate the humerus. But where the latissimus dorsi is a posterior muscle, so it extends the arm, the pectoralis major is an anterior muscle, so it's going to flex, flex. flex the arm. So there are your three actions of the pectoralis major. Flex the arm, adduct the arm, and medially rotate. All right. Questions on that? Hour one time. Excellent. All right. So that is our pectoralis major. Notice, we, good news is we only have one more muscle we have to do the origins and insertions is. That is the good news. The bad news is it's the tricep brachial. And so why is that bad news? Because there's three origins. Yeah, three heads, three, three bellies, heads. three origins, exactly. So let's draw them first. Let's identify them by name. What are the three bellies of the, or the three heads of the tricep brachia called? The long head, the lateral head, and the medial head. There you go. Long head, lateral head, and medial head. Let's start easy. Medial. Guess where the medial head is located? Medially. Medially, absolutely excellent. And the tricep brachia is the prominent posterior muscle. So when we think of the origin of the medial head, it is going to obviously be posterior because it's a posterior muscle. It is obviously going to be medial but the other trick to it is it is distal. It is basically down distal on the humerus. And that makes the medial the smallest muscle or what helps me to remember it is the medial muscle is mini. So down here, on the posterior, medial, and distal portion of the humerus, we have the origin of the medial head. Questions on that? I'll move that now, so now I have to move this back. All right, everybody's quiet. So that means they've mastered and understand the material. So let's talk about the lateral head. Again, being part of the triceps brachia, most obviously it is posterior. Being the lateral head, guess what else it is? Lateral. Lateral. 
And in this case, it is going to be proximal. Now it turns out the lateral head is the only one that's on the lateral side of the humerus. So our lateral head is also lonely. So hanging out here all by its lonesome on the proximal lateral portion of the humerus is the origin of the lateral head. Questions on that one? What's the third head? Long head. And guess why the long head is called the long head? Long. That's the long head. It's the longest. And it is, in fact, so long that it actually goes past the humerus all the way to the scapula. And where does this long head originate on the scapula? The infraglenoid tubercle. Yeah, that rough and bump right underneath the glenoid cavity. So the long head is so long, it goes all the way to the scapula. So the medial head is mini, the lateral head is lonely, and the long head is, well, long. Now, these three all come together into a single tendon, which provides one single insertion. And what is the one sole insertion of the triceps brachia? All the cranial process of the ulna. Yeah. Basically the bump of the elbow. So that bump of the elbow is where all three muscles come into it. It's actually a pretty easy muscle to find as we'll see in the picture. I don't want to change the picture yet because as we, when we change the picture, I lose my drawings. But all three of them have a very common tendon and that tendon is an obvious structure on the posterior part of the arm. So if you find that tendon, from that tendon, we can find all three bellies. And so we'll do that when we look at the picture in a second, but I wanna finish this off first. And to finish this off, we need to talk actions. How many joints does our tricep brachia cross? Two. Two. Thanks to the long head, it crosses the shoulder and it also crosses the elbow. It is a posterior muscle. So what is its action on the shoulder? Extends. Extends the shoulder. What is its uh, action on the elbow? Extends. Extends the elbow. Is it on the stable bone or the movable bone? Stable. Stable. So can it pronate or supinate? No. Nope. So how many actions does the tricep brachia have? Two. Two. Now again, you can easily memorize that, but notice by just looking at the origins and the insertions, we were actually able to figure it out. That's one of the reasons we take the time to do this, looking at where the muscle is located on the body, knowing where its origins and its insertions are, tell you exactly what it's going to do. This muscle crosses two joints and is on the stable bone of the arm, of the forearm. It is a posterior muscle. So it extends the shoulder and it extends the elbow. All right, let's look at it on the pretty pictures. Notice, as I mentioned, the easiest way you're gonna find the tricep brachia is to find that big prominent tendon that always attaches to the elbow. And once you find that, you can clearly find the three muscles. Notice one muscle is over, one belly is over here 
on the lateral side all by itself. So this lateral lonely muscle all by itself, what is this belly? Long lateral. lateral head, remember it's lateral because it's lonely, lateral is lonely. Notice it's only going oh. to the humerus. Notice this muscle belly is so long that it goes all the way to the scapula. So this one that leaves the humerus to go all the way to the scapula, which one's that one? Long. That's the long head. And notice we have the smallest, dare I say, miniest of the bellies. And what's the mini belly of the tricep brachia? We can see this nicely on our models as well. Notice again, here we can clearly see that tendon. Based on what we see, we have this belly here all by itself. What's this one here all by itself? Lateral. Lateral head. What belly would this one be that we see leaving the humerus and going up towards the scapula? Uh -huh. And we don't see it on this picture, but tucked down there would be that uh, mini that would be the uh, medial. Let's see what our before I waste our time to go there, let's see if our, that's not a bad view, that's not the one I wanted. Okay, I'm not sure, I wouldn't use this on the exam, but it, it is uh, not a bad way to see this, whoops. So again, I would use a picture that should be more obvious than this. But since we're sitting here discussing this together, notice as we look here at the arm, here again is our bicep brachia with its two bellies, right? And notice here, we can see the short head going up to the coracoid process, there's our scapula. And notice over here, if we look closely, we can see one muscle whose belly has a tendon that goes all the way up to the scapula. So what must this muscle right here be? The long. Long head of the tricep brachia. And while it's not the best picture of the tricep brachia because we can't see the tendon, notice we can see that tiny little mini muscle coming off of there. That would be the medial head. So we see the medial and the long head. Notice now we got to clear our image. Here, again, obvious example of the tendon. Clearly see the tendon here. Clearly see the lonely lateral head. Clearly see the long head going up towards the scapula. And even here, you can just see the teeniest part of that medial head that's there as well. So again, not the bestest of pictures, but still uh, we can kind of make it out on that see if this has a better picture. Okay, here, this one's a little bit better where again, we can see the long head and we can see the medial head, that tiny little medial head and that long head from that medial view. So that's not bad. The definition is not great on this one for this particular model, but it serves a purpose for this. Like I said, I wouldn't use examples like this on the test. I'd try to use more obvious examples, but it's still not a bad place to practice this while you're learning it. All righty. And here, best view. Notice this one again. This one, we can clearly see the two bellies of the bicep brachia and the three bellies of our tricep brachia from that anterior and that posterior view. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So one more thing that I wanna go over and actually before we do it here, I would like to do it. 
We will go over this again on Wednesday, but I think this is a good starting point. So at this point, just put your pen and pencil down, just watch and look and think and listen. At what we're looking at here. Here we are looking at a, well, actually let's do this two ways. Do, 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 do. I can guarantee you with 100% certainty that you will see a scapula on the lab exam. If you think about it, there's so much we've already talked about on this scapula. I can have my nice big, we'll make it pink arrow. Identify the muscle that originates from this bone feature, be specific. A long head of the tricep brachia. Identify the bone feature that originates from this bone feature. Be specific. A short head, bicep brachia. There you go. Excellent. Um, identify the muscle that originates from this bone feature, be specific. Long what? What am I pointing at? What bone feature am I pointing at? The long head of the bicep brachia. Notice, remember when we were learning the scapula, we learned these two stupid little roughed up parts. Little roughed up part above the glenoid cavity, little roughed up point below the glenoid cavity. The supraglenoid tubercle up here and the infraglenoid tubercle right there. And at the time that we learned it, it seemed like stupid things. But now we know that this supraglenoid tubercle, this little roughed up bump above the scapula is where the long head of the bicep brachia originates. And this roughed up bump underneath the glenoid cavity, the infraglenoid tubercle, what muscle be specific originates there? The long head of the triceps. Long head of the biceps, a uh, triceps brachia. So long head of the biceps brachia, long head of the triceps brachia. Located on these bone features. And again, identify, I don't like this black. Identify the muscle that originates from this bone feature, be specific. The short head of the biceps brachii. Excellent. Identify the muscle that inserts into that bone feature. The brachialis? Nope. What muscle inserts into the coracoid process? You have to go back a day to remember it, but you should have the list Rectalis of minor. minor. Vector Alice Minor, excellent. Identify the muscle that originates from this bone feature. Atrapezius? What originates from the bone feature? Deltoid. Deltoid. Yeah. However, if I asked you what muscle inserts into the bone feature, then what would you say? Trapezius. Trapezius. So notice there are a lot of origins and insertions we've talked about on this. Oh, we can do one more. 
uh, identify the muscle that originates from the bone feature. Dismiss door, say, ooh, I can do even one more. Identify the muscle that inserts into this bone feature. Might color it in the anterior medial border of the scapula. The lumbars? No, close. Serratus anterior. But you are correct if instead I had said identify the muscle that inserts into the posterior medial border then that would be what? Rhomboids. That would be the rhomboids, absolutely. So again, notice ton of muscles that insert or originate from the scapula. And we can do one more. Actually, we can do four more. There is this indentation above the spine on the scapula. Does anybody remember what that bone feature was called? Supraspinous uh, fossa. Supraspinous yeah, fossa, excellent. And guess what muscle sits in the supraspinous fossa? Supraspinatus. Excellent. Then there was this indentation below the infraspinous spine, spinous fossa. infraspinous fossa, and guess what muscle sits in the infraspinous fossa? Infraspinatus. And again, I don't care how you spell it, as I mean, you know, you pronounce it as long as you spell it correctly. Notice there is On the anterior side of the scapula, there's this nice big indentation. What was this big indentation on the anterior side of the scapula called? The subscapular fossa. Subscapular fossa. And guess what muscle sits in the subscapular fossa? Subscapularis. Excellent. Lastly, there is a big well, not lastly, but there is a big ball shape muscle that attaches to the uh, inferior angle of the uh, scapula. And this, uh, this, this uh, uh, tube shape, nice round bulb shaped muscle uh, attaches to the humerus. Any idea? what this big, large, circular muscle, tube-shaped muscle might be? Teres minor. It's actually the teres major. However, is the teres major on our list? No. No, so we don't care. But where there is a major, guess what else there is? Minor. A minor. And so as it turns out, right across from the terrace major on the posterior part of the scapula is a muscle called the terrace minor. So notice for three of these, we are able to easily identify the muscle by the indentation that we learned. And notice if we move from the bone itself to this con uh, the convenient muscle picture we have in the, on the uh, handout for class, lo and behold, we can indeed see these muscles in place. Get this out of my way, up here. So put down here. Excellent. So notice this muscle up in the supraspinous fossa. What would that be? 
two plus tinnitus. Excellent. This muscle here under the spinous process, what would that be? Infraspinatus. Infraspinatus, excellent. This muscle on the anterior part, what would that be? Subscapularis. Subscapularis. Notice there is this big chunky muscle that comes off and actually is separated, independent, comes off and attaches to the humerus. What muscle might that be? Teres minor. Teres major. Dark major, sorry. But remember, we don't care about the teres major. The teres major, though, is big. Notice we can see it from the front and from the back. However, from the posterior side, we can see this tiny ball-shaped muscle that comes up and attaches. And guess that green doesn't show up very well. We'll use blue. Guess what this tiny muscle here is? Teres minor. Teres minor. Notice these three, four, sorry, these four muscles all come together. I used a dark blue and all of their tendons come and wrap around the head of the humerus. In fact, these are the only muscles whose tendons attach to the head of the humerus. And notice they do a really good job of holding that head of the humerus in place. You could almost say that it forms almost like a cuff-like structure stabilizing the head of the humerus in place. And what do you think these, the muscle group that these four muscles collectively form are known as? There you go. This is your rotator cuff. You hear about pitchers, you hear about quarterbacks, right? Tearing their rotator cuff. Well, it's typically the tendon of one of these four muscles. So these four muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor collectively form your rotator cuff. Stabilizing the head of humerus in place and moving the humerus through space. Now, obviously they're not the primary movers, but they're providing that nice structure and support for our humerus. All right, questions on any of the muscles? All right, if we know the four muscles, then let's see if we can figure out their actions. Let's start first by looking at the supraspinatus. Notice the supraspinatus comes right down through the scapula and clavicle and attaches to the top, right over the top. No medial, no lateral, just right over the top kind of make it, even though its belly is back here, it kind of makes it a, a lateral muscle like the deltoid. And what do lateral muscles do? Abduction. Abduction. Now, is that the one bringing your arm all the way up in space? No. No. In fact, this one can only abduct the arm about 20 degrees. So this one doesn't help you do your jumping jacks, but when you're at that wedding this Saturday night, and you're doing the chicken dance, this one can help you do the chicken dance because you're only abducting your arm about 15 to 20 degrees. So how many actions does the supraspinatus have? One. One. Let's look here at the front. Notice even though the subscapularis is a broad kind of converging looking muscle, it basically is straight across the primary one holding on to the humerus from the front. So it can't really move the humerus up and down or around or anything, but what it can do is pull the anterior part of your humerus forward. And what kind of action would that be? Medial rotation. Medial rotation. Notice 
if the subscapularis on the front can medially rotate, then the infraspinatus on the back, what's it going to be able to do? Laterally. Laterally rotate. But notice, instead of coming straight across, it's at a little more of an angle. So not only can it laterally rotate, but it has a little bit more leverage on the humerus as well. So not only can it laterally rotate, but what else can it do? AD duct. AD duct. So it brings the arm in and laterally rotates it. And notice the terrace minor has the biggest angle. So even though it's the smallest muscle, it has the most actions. It's right underneath the infraspinatus. So like the infraspinatus, it's going to AD duck. Like the infraspinatus, it is going to laterally rotate. But what is the one thing that the terrace minor can do that the infraspinatus cannot? Extend. Extend. Bring it back. So there you go. Those are the four muscles of the rotator cuff, their names, their locations. Notice we don't need to know the origins and insertions, but can we easily find where they belong on the scapula? Yes. Absolutely. So on the exam, can I show you a picture of a scapula and have a nice big fat arrow that points right here and ask you to identify the muscle that would be located in this indentation? Yes. And what would that be? Subscapularis. There you go. So know the muscles, know the actions, and know where you'd find them on the scapula. All righty, excellent. Notice your book also does a really nice job of showing these. Here we see the subscapularis and the supraspinatus. There's again the sub, uh, uh, supraspinatus cut at the end the infraspinatus, the terrace minor. And notice this one, you really get a good sense of that terrace major. Notice the terrace major comes off the bottom, comes over to the humerus, and there's that little bit of gap in between. Notice it does not come up here and attach to the head of the humerus. That's why the terrace minor is not part of your rotator cuff. And that's why the terrace minor is not one of the muscles you're responsible for. But what you are responsible for is the terrace minor. And the terrace minor is part of the rotator cuff, does come up and connect to the head of the humerus, whereas the terrace major does not. But the terrace major is a very easy landmark. If you can find that terrace major, which is a really easy landmark, then it's very easy to find the terrace minor, which is right across the gap from it. All right. Questions on that? All right. The good news is the only thing we have left to do in the arm is the forearm. But as I mentioned, the forearm is, I think, one of the more challenging parts. So I think the best thing to do is rather than try to rush through it now, is come at it fresh on Wednesday. So any questions on any of the muscles of the arm that we did cover today? All right, excellent. You've either all fallen asleep or you're all satisfied with the information. Uh, either way, I guess I'm content. I'm ready to fall asleep too. All right. I think I'm still a little drunk from last night. <laughs> no, just kidding. All righty, excellent. Excellent. All righty, so then with that, we are done. Finish a half an hour early. Uh, don't tell uh, your loved ones that your class is done so that way you can get a quick half an hour nap and then come out bright and fresh at 1235 and pretend the class just ended. All right, excellent. Well, that's at least what I'm gonna do. All right, guys, have a, a good day and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.